What does it really mean to be unshakable? It's not just a matter of money, it's a state of mind. When you're truly unshakable, you have an unwavering confidence amidst the storm. It's not that nothing upsets you, we all get hooked at times, but you just don't stay there. Nothing rattles you for any length of time. This state of mind allows you to be a leader, not a follower, to be the chess player, not the chess piece, to be one of the few who do, not the many who talk. Hi, I'm Richard Bradley, Editor-in-Chief of Worth Magazine and host of the Unshakable Podcast. I'm here with the world's leading life and business strategist, Tony Robbins. Tony's been named twice to the Worth Power 100 as one of the most influential people in global finance. Along his side is Peter Malouk, CEO of the wealth management firm Creative Planning and the only man in history to be ranked the number one financial advisor by Barron's three years in a row. Tony, the idea of being unshakable is clearly more than money. But in this context, what does it truly mean to be unshakable? It's a state of mind. Uh, it relates to money because most people, when they're trying to figure out how to create financial freedom, create more stress for themselves, worrying about what's going on. And when you're truly unshakable, you have the mindset where you understand how the market works. You understand that real estate can go up or down, stocks can go up or down, but your family can still do well. Unshakable is a bear market can come, a correction can come and there's no fear in you, or if there is a little fear, we're all human, you don't stay there. You find a way to break through, you find your center. And when you have that center, you do what's right to be able to take care of yourself and your family. So we live in a world right now where most people don't even believe they can achieve financial freedom anymore because there's so much volatility. I mean, think about it, we have negative interest rates. In 5,000 years, Richard, banking, we've never in our history had a place where I give you my money and I paid you to hang on to it. I give you my money to a bank, you pay me for interest. I make money off of it and then they loan it to someone else. We're living in times that are crazy. Toyota right now has a bond that they're selling for 0.001. That's your return for giving the money. It'll take you 69,000 years to double your money. I mean, this has never happened in history. And I was interviewing about a year and a half ago, uh, you know, the former Fed chair, Alan Greenspan, who for 19 years, the most powerful man in finance in the world under four different presidents, spent five hours with him, about three privately and two on stage in front of a group. And one of my final questions to him, and we talked about all this crazy change and all this volatility and how do people get things together, I said, look, if you were back head of the Fed today, what would you do? And there was this long pause. He paused, he paused, and he leaned in me. He said, Tony, I'd resign. <laughs> that did not build much confidence in me or anybody else who'd be watching. And yet, in the midst of all that, as you well know, there's a few unicorns in the financial market, very few. These people that have found a way to do well over all the decades, in good times and in bad. And they know what it takes to be unshakable. And it isn't just guts or confidence, it's understanding certain facts that when you know them, they free you. The metaphor I give people is that, you know, if you go, you know, most of us have heard the old Sufi metaphor of, you know, the man is walking along in the middle of the night and he sees a snake and freaks out, and runs away, and he comes in in the morning, and what does he see? It was a rope. And so once you know it's a rope, you, you can be there in the middle of the night and you're not scared again. This book, Unshakable, is this, it's really a financial freedom playbook for anybody. It's the real essentials about how to go from where you are to where you really want to be, but how to do it with peace of mind, how to do it even when things are volatile and enjoy yourself. And I'm really proud that we're also donating 100% of the profits as we did with Money Master the Game to feed another 50 million people. We're going to feed, I fed 200 million people the last two years with Feeding America as my partner. I'm going to feed a billion people. And this is part of that. So this book is something that can change somebody's life. And while you're doing it, really take care of other people that are in need. We got 45 million people in this country that don't know where their next meal's coming from. 17 million are children. While you're changing your own life, we want to make a difference for them too. You mentioned Money Master the Game. You wrote that book two years ago, and in the two years since, it sold over a million copies. Incredibly impressive. So why another book now? Why, are you, why did you write Unshakable? Well, I'm really proud of Money Master the Game, and I hope people will still pick it up and read it. But it is 670 pages. <laughs> you know, what I did is I said, I saw what happened in 2008, and I said, this can't be. I have the good fortune of having coached Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 financial traders in the history of the world, for the last 24 years. And he hasn't lost money in those 24 years that I've worked with him. So as a result of that, I've learned a lot, as you might imagine. He literally emails me each day. We measure these elements for two and a half decades. But 
at the same time, when 2008 happened, I saw people losing their homes. I saw people losing half their net worth overnight. And I knew what was the trigger because I was working with Paul. So I thought, what if I wrote a book where I interviewed the smartest financial people in the world, the people you and I both have the privilege to interact with now, and I interviewed 50 of them. Not people from the Lucky Sperm Club, but people who literally started with nothing and built something of that scope, and they did it through investing. And what I learned were the strategies that could change anybody's life. So I put that in the book, and, and I was gratified that it became number one New York Times bestseller, and as you said, sold a million copies in hardback. But in addition to that, what was really cool was people's lives were changed by that book because it wasn't me. It was the best investors in the world sharing it with you. And so I don't like writing books. I'd you know, rather pull out my teeth, quite frankly. And I hadn't written a book for 20 years. And Steve Forbes said it was, you know, if there was a Pulitzer Prize for an investment book, this one would have went hands down. So I wrote this great book. So answer your question, why another one? Because in the last year and a half, these crazy changes we're talking about with feds all the world are happening. Volatility has increased. No one is clear where the world is going. Uh, I was talking to Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital and he, re he manages a hundred billion dollars. And he said to me, he said, Tony, you know, if you're not confused, you don't know what's going on, right? right. It's, it's, that's the world that we're in. So I thought I want to do three things with this book. I want to write a short book. I want to find a book that you can hold in your hand and not live weights with and that you could read in a weekend or you know, a long day if you're really committed to and give you all the essentials that can change your life. But the second reason I wrote it besides a short book that anybody can get through and use is I really wanted to write a book where we could dispel the fear where we could take that you know, snake and turn it into the rope that it really is. So that you can begin to understand that there's no reason to fear these things and you can participate in this tremendous opportunity in the market for people to grow and even take advantage of the worst times. Because I know you know that the greatest time for someone to leapfrog from financial survival to financial freedom is during the toughest times. Things burn down faster than they grow. The opportunities are extraordinary at that time. And we're gonna talk about that in our next podcast to give people some real specifics. But it is your opportunity to really leapfrog from where you are to where you wanna be. And you wanna be prepared so you don't get hurt. And you wanna take advantage because that's where the greatest opportunities are. You know, you, you listen in to somebody like Warren Buffett, I had the privilege of interviewing, and his whole approach is, I want to be, I wanna take advantage. I wanna be in a position when everyone else is afraid, I want to be greedy. When everybody is greedy, I want to be afraid. And so this book really shows you that. And then the third and final reason I wrote this is the financial industry is, a, is made up of good human beings, very talented human beings. But the incentives in that system are not to take care of you as the investor. These are corporations. They're multi-billion, almost some of them you know, approaching a trillion dollars over decades of revenue that they're generating. And their number one focus is to take care of their shareholders. Well, the way you do that is more fees. And the fees are so hidden that most people know the Obama administration this last year, at least on the 401k side, try to pass some rules that look like they may just get ejected now under the Trump administration. But it's because $17 billion in fees are being taken from people. You know, 1% in fees, just 1% more than you need to pay, because of compounding, will cost you 10 years of income in retirement. It could be the difference between retiring broke, having money for a few years, or having for as long as you live. So I really wanna take care of people and protect people. And so those three things, write a short book you can absorb right now that anyone can use, whether you're a millennial just getting started and you've all this debt and think you'll never get free, or whether you're a baby boomer, think you started too late. Here's the financial playbook to really get you where you wanna go. So Tony, folks who are listening to the podcast can't hear this, but sitting alongside us here is Peter Malouk. Talk a little bit about how the two of you connected and how Peter came to be the co-author with you of Unshakable. Well, first of all, I have unbelievable respect for Peter. He's, we're partners and he's become a dear, dear friend of mine. But it's kind of interesting. I wrote Money Master the Game. I dug in and pulled out all of the abuses that I thought had happened in the system. Um, you know, we went out and kind of freed people from this. I mean, they're able to put 10 years, sometimes 20 years of income back in their pocket. But then I got a call from Peter and I had actually been really focused on what's called the fiduciary standard. It's a big word, but what it really means is most financial people that you go to, most people that you consider to be a financial consultant or a supporter or whatever you want to call them, they're brokers. 90% are brokers. Nothing wrong with a broker, but a broker does not have to put your needs ahead of their own. It's crazy. All they got to do is give you an investment that's called suitable, which means they think it'll work for you. That's it. But there's less than 10% of the 300,000 people in the financial industry, the ones that aren't brokers, 
these independent registered investment advisors are called fiduciaries. They are responsible to legally put your needs ahead of their own. If they say buy Apple this morning and they buy it themselves for themselves this afternoon and they get a better deal, the law requires they give you their stock. That's how strong the laws are. But it's a real small subset of groups. So I was promoting fiduciaries and I even recommended a series of like 10 different firms and Peter's firm was one of those because his firm and Peter himself as you said earlier, he's the only firm and he's the only individual financial advisor to be named by Barron's three years in a row as the number one financial advisor in the country. So his track record was extraordinary. So when he called me up and said, Tony, I know you care so much about people, you're trying to protect them, but there's some dead bodies you need to see out there. There's, some, there's ways of manipulating the system, even for people that call themselves fiduciaries. And he flew out on a weekend. I was doing a seminar. He never leaves on the weekend with his family. I really respect him for that. But it was the only time we could meet. He traveled all that way. We sat down and he dropped this set of insights on me. And I was devastated, quite frankly. I was angry. I was pissed off. I mean, like, how could people do this? Take advantage of people. And also because I'm trying to steer people in the right way. And I found some of these individuals, these organizations who I really like, in order to try to survive and make enough money, they've adapted some interesting approaches that we're going to talk about here. But Peter's the one that freed that. And when I sat there at the end of it, I was like, Peter, I said, you know, what you're doing here, you, he's created a home office for people. You know, you know, billionaires have home offices. They have a dozen people, seven, eight, nine people whose entire focus is every aspect. They're not just putting together a portfolio. They look at how to protect your risk. They look at your taxes. They look at estate planning. They look at everything to take care of you. And, you know, you usually got to be a billionaire to do that. He started doing that for millionaires, you know, for small businesses, which is the backbone of this country. And I said to him, I said, what if we partnered? But I said, if we partnered, I would love to join your board. I would love to you know, step in and really help you understand by being maybe the chief investor psychology, how investors think so we meet their deepest needs even more so. But he's already managing now $22 billion, you're number one. I said, but would you be willing to do this for people with as little as $100,000 so that the average person just beginning the journey, someone who's early in the journey could still do this. They don't have to be a millionaire or a billionaire to do it. And he went back, talked to his team and came back and said, we can set up another division and do this. So we became partners. And so now I'm, I'm a partner with him in, this, in the firm. I'm on the board of directors, partners in writing the book. And I just want to get this message out. And Peter's one of the smartest guys. I mean, he's the guy that navigated 2008 to 2009 during that time, the big bear, you know, one of the greatest economic challenges in our history. And we'll talk a little bit later about how well they did. Quite extraordinary. Peter, I think a lot of people would be reluctant to reach out to Tony Robbins and say, hey, Tony, I love the book, but I got to tell you, there's some things you need to know. Talk a little bit about what prompted you to, to, to reach out to Tony. Well, I read the book. I mean, a lot of my clients had read the book. They'd come in with the book in their hand and they'd say, talk to me about, are you a fiduciary and all that? I loved it because most of it spoke directly to what we were already doing. And I could tell from reading it that he had really tried to navigate all of this, that somewhere along the way he got pissed off about something. And I found out later it was his 401k plan and he decided he was just going to figure it out. And this book was an incredible attempt at that. I mean, he's interviewing these 50 50, I've never seen, I don't think it has ever been done, where you have that many successful people at investing with different points of views, but very common thread through most of them. And he's bringing all those ideas, but he had a couple things that really stood out that were the same thing we talk about creative planning. You should have a fiduciary. You should be sensitive to fees. You should be sensitive to, to conflicts. Don't try to market time. Don't waste your time trading stocks all day in your pajamas at home. These are, the core message really matched up with us. So I thought, hey, I'm at least going to, offer this and you know frankly i did not expect you know tony to call me back and, and be willing to listen not only was he willing to listen like he said he asked me to come back out come out there and meet with him and when i did i and i was went there and of course he's he he was in the middle of an event and he had budget he broke out some time for me and he said hey we've only got a, a an hour or 45 minutes or something like that and i i talked for 10 minutes and tony i mean he was really like looked at the other people in the room as advisors like I can't believe some of what I'm hearing. And I said, that's really all I got. And he goes, are you serious? And I said, yeah, and I left. And he called me, uh, I think it was the next day or a few days later and said, wow, we looked at all that and I'm learning something new, let's keep talking. And, and I'll tell you what I love about Tony that matches the firm, because a lot of people have seen me in the media, maybe one one thousandth of the time you see Tony, but stylistically and physically we're pretty different people, right? <laughs> But we have some things in common. Yeah. If you think about the title of the book, Unshakable, when he came up with that, he said, what do you think of that? I thought that's absolutely perfect because whenever you're at a 
party and you hear somebody say, I lost everything, which you and I have heard the crowds we run in, they hear that all the time. Uh, people are worth 100,000, they're worth zero, or they're worth 20 million, and they're worth you know half a million. And they go, it was 08 or the 9-11 or the tech bubble. Well, it's impossible to have lost money through those if you were invested even halfway right and didn't make a mistake. And what you really find is people, uh, they get in their own way and because they're shakable, right? They, most people react negatively. And why are they shakable? Why do they make those mistakes? Because of uncertainty. Where does the uncertainty come from? Fear. What, where is the fear? No education. What does Tony do for a living? Not just with money, but everything else. He tries to compress the learning curve for people, help them figure out exactly you know, how to think about things and give them a roadmap. Well, that's what we've tried to do at Creative Planning. And we're very successful at it. We're one of the top independent uh, firms in the country. Uh, we're very proud of everything we accomplished you know, before the partnership. But when I write a letter, it's not gonna be written by as many, uh, read by as many people as when Tony does. I wrote a book. Tony's book said, sold 20 times uh, more copies, and I've been in the business for 20 years, right? So what a wonderful opportunity to put a megaphone on what we've been trying to do, which is to educate and empower people so that they have that certainty so they become unshakable. And if you're unshakable, then you're going to have a better investment outcome. It's, it's that simple. So his messaging uh, and what he was trying to do, it really matched up perfectly, and it's been a, a great, great ride ever since then. And I wanted to, in this book, the reason I asked Peter to co-author it with me was I wanted to cover not only the psychology and I wanted to bring all these other investors, but I really wanted to gear people up so that when the inevitable corrections and the inevitable bear market comes, and we're right now approaching eight years, the second largest you know, bull market in history, when that changes, and it always does, I wanted people protected and I wanted not only protected, I wanted them to thrive, not just survive. And I had all this great information for all these individuals, but Peter had taken his firm and grown it geometrically with virtually no advertising because he got such unbelievable results in the midst of the worst downturn you can imagine. You guys grew from what to what? Do you remember? 500 million to a couple billion in, inside that two years. In two years. Yeah. And during the worst economic time, everybody gravitated to them because everybody else is freaking out. And here are these people getting great results. So in the book, the specifics about what to do in a bear market, the specific plans and so forth are really Peter's plan. So I'm also not a financial, legal financial planner. My expertise is psychology, synthesis, taking the very best and then communicating a way someone can act on it. Because I always say, say to people, knowledge is not power. You know, knowledge is information, it's potential power. What's real power is execution. You know, execution trumps knowledge every day of the week. So I wanted to write something short, quick, brief, but with a real plan that's proven so that you can literally become more fearless or what we call unshakable. Peter, I know you you contributed to the book. You wrote some of that real plan. Talk a little bit about uh, your contribution to the book and, and what kinds of advice you're giving people. Well, I think like if you look at the financial services industry, you have conflict, but then you have polar opposites in advice. On the one end, you, you have... Let's go in the market, let's go out of the market, let's trade stocks all the time. A lot of evidence, it doesn't work for most people, whether you hear that from, you want to believe Buffett when he says it, or Bogle when he says it, or I when I say it, there's a lot of people that say that doesn't work. But those people tend to be buy and hold, do nothing ever. Okay, buy these eight things and don't ever do anything. And I think that's a real big mistake. And so one of the great opportunities to be able to write a little more specifically in the book was, hey look, yes, some of this you know, the crazy day trading in your pajamas isn't probably gonna work out for you very well. Most hedge funds you have access to are probably not going to work out for you well. And here's the evidence, right? We don't just say it, we show the evidence. But hey, you don't have to just settle for holding all the time. It's in the bear market. Is That's the opportunity. And so we outlined in the books you know, some of the things that we did with our clients to take advantage of that opportunity so that we're, we're, we're not doing nothing, but we're not doing things that create damage either. We're trying to stay in the game, get the upside. But when bad things happen, that's the chance to really get ahead of the marketplace. So Tony, it's unusual to launch a book and do a podcast at the same time. Why'd you decide to, to do this that way? I just think that people having a partner, an audio partner, in some cases video partner like this, people can use net time, you know, no extra time. They can do it when they're driving their car, they can do it when they're working out, they can listen to it and reinforce it. You know, obviously the podcast doesn't go to the depth of the book, but I wanted to get some of that core information out there. I mean, the bottom line is uh, neither one of us are taking a dime from this book. I wrote this book so we can feed another 50 million people. I'm gonna match that so we feed another 100 million people on the way to the billion that I'm going for. But I also want to just be able to provide something that people really use. And I think if you combine audio with the written word, I think you've got a chance to reinforce it. It's all about accessibility, isn't it? It really is. To make it as easy as possible for people yeah. to get real results. So lots of people have massive fears. 
when it comes to the stock market. Their emotions are in overdrive whenever the talking heads are calling for the next big crash, and that seems like it's happening every other All the time. Week. <laughs> but early in the book, you guys cover seven freedom facts, which are some pretty mind-blowing facts about market behavior that when you, people understand them, they're sure to help free them from being their own worst enemy and being so fearful about participating in the stock market and, and when to make decisions. Let's go through them. Um, let's talk about uh, freedom fact number one. On average, corrections have occurred about once a year since 1900. Is okay. that a lot or a little? Well, you tell me. I think most people, you know, they're all worried about a correction. And when you see that literally in 115 years, from 1900 to 2015, we've averaged one a year, it can allow you to say, I don't need to react to this. This is natural. It's like a season. Winter comes every year. You know, you don't, if you react to winter and freak out, you're going to be stressed out all the time as opposed to be prepared for winter, take advantage of winter. Some people are freeze to death. You want to be well supplied so you can ski, snow more, be with your family yeah. and friends, and hopefully do well enough. You can help those that didn't plan, right? That's really what it's about. So. If you think about it, it, the average correction lasts 56 days, so less than two months. Last year was a perfect example. 2016, if you remember January, the first, what was it, nine or 10 days of the month was the worst nine or 10 days in the history of, of the stock market openings, of, you know, opening of years. And I remember at the time, uh, people were freaking out. You know, the market dropped. Well, how many points was it the one day? Was it seven? Couple hundred, yeah. yeah. Oh, the, no, that, the one day. Almost 500, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Five, six, I think it was 600. Yeah. I'm not positive. But, you know, people were freaking out. Everybody was in Davos, you know, all the wealthiest <laughs> people in the world. They went there. They put Ray Dalio on. If you don't know who Ray Dalio is, he's the largest hedge fund and most successful hedge fund guy in history, right? Um, this is a man who's... You know, you had to have a $5 billion net worth and give him $100 million 10 years ago to take money. Now he won't take your money no matter who you are. And he had taught me in, his, in the first book, Money Master the Game, his formula. And I shared that formula and it helped a lot of people. He got up on camera and people said, what do we do? The world's marking down. The end is coming. And he said, well, Tony Robbins wrote this book. You know, I had to pick it up. And in the chapter, he explains some ways to do this. So it was really gratifying to see that that would make such a difference for people. But what really makes a difference is to realize it didn't last. The year ended up, we broke all kinds of records last year, and but it looked so dark. It yeah. looked like it was the end. And so it's really important for people to know this is on average 54 days, less than two months. It happens every year like clockwork. Now here's what you gotta know though. In the last 100 years, the average drop was 13%, a little more than 13. Now in the last 30 years, the average drop is in 14%. Well, when you lose 14%, at least on paper, pretty hard for most people to hang on. And so what do they do? They sell at exactly the worst time, right? And they take those losses and make them permanent. The stock market never took money from anybody. Only you can do that by your decisions, That's right. right? And so if you understand that this is normal, this is winter, winter always comes, some are more severe than others, some are shorter, some are longer, but they come every year, then all of a sudden your brain starts to go, I don't have to overreact. And what makes you successful is to stay in the market. And there's a lot of very, very smart people that you, they can know all of this and they're still going to react negatively. They have to be really empowered with information. And the reason is sometimes there's a kernel of truth, sometimes there isn't. And usually there's a narrative. Like if you look at what Tony was referencing early in 2016, January, February, oil prices were plummeting. OPEC said they're going to let, let oil float. And now we, we've got the U.S. They're talking about recession. Eight of the ten uh, major uh, banks in the United States said oil was going to go even lower. So you have, a, you have a narrative. It's not like it's randomly happening, but we know this story. It's kind of like going to a Sandra Bullock movie. We kind of know we're going to laugh, we're going to cry. But you, you know, even if you, someone tells you the whole story in advance, there's going to be a point where you're supposed to be crying, and I'm going to look over at my wife, and she's going to be crying, right? I mean, so we're humans. We react when we're going through it, even when we know what's going to happen. And I think the key is you have to not only know what's going on, like Tony's talking about, but you got to take it a step further and be excited about it. Yeah. Actually say, this is, this is an opportunity. I only get this opportunity, like Tony said, about once a year. Now I, now's the time to go into action. And once you've made that shift, you know you've, you've arrived. You've, you've truly, yeah. that first step is the first step to being unshakable. And it's based on a pattern of facts. So what's another pattern? Another pattern is, okay, this, how do I know this is a correction? Just to clarify for everyone, a correction, a, a bear market, as you know, is 20% drop from its peak, right? So anything below that, you know, in the 10% range or above is gonna be a correction. 
And so most people are afraid, is this correction? First yeah. of all, most people think of a correction as a bear market. They don't make the difference, yeah. right? They don't see this as temporary. They don't see it as normal. They think, oh my God, the world is ending. And so then they make these dumb decisions, unfortunately, that can destroy your financial future. But if you know that these corrections happen every year and that less than 20% of them ever grow into a bear market, which means you know, one in five, so one in five years, that's really what we're talking about, then if 80% of the time it's not gonna get worse, then maybe I ought to take advantage of this. Maybe I, when everybody else is afraid, that is your greatest opportunity. That is Warren Buffett's number one you know, totem, his motto is take advantage during those times. So that's freedom fact number two, that less than 20% of all corrections will ever actually turn into a bear market. That's right. Right, let's talk about freedom fact number three. Nobody can consistently predict whether the market is going to rise or fall. Well, I think this is interesting because there's so much, uh, so many advisors, that's what they're selling, right? And so th this is what's interesting about the profession. That they can predict. Yeah, that they're selling, hey, I can predict, I can navigate this. I mean, there are different words for it, downside protection or exit strategy, you know, things like that. But they're all generally related to forecasting. And I think what's problematic with that is people are trained when you go to a professional, if I go to a doctor, if I go to an architect or an engineer or a CPA, my expectation is there's some industry standard based on academic evidence and you're going to advise me and put me in a better spot. That couldn't be further from the truth in the financial services profession. Most of the time, you'd be better off not hiring a particular advisor, and this would be one group to be concerned about is, to me, it's a great litmus test. If you're sitting down with somebody and, and you say, hey, tell me how you're gonna help me, and they go, well, I'm gonna look at indicators and tell you when to exit the market, that you can stop the meeting right there, get up, and as Tony talks about in his Run. books, you just go, go find somebody else. It's a great uh, litmus test question. You know, Bogle said, I've not only never seen anybody can do it, I've never met anybody who met anybody that can do it. And I'll say at Creative Planning, we have 15,000 clients, I've been doing this about 20 years, I have never in my career ever seen a client exit the market and get back in even moderately close to the right time. I mean, forget about getting it right, not, not even remotely close. Then you get in transaction costs, taxes, the outcome is very, very negative. So if, if you don't wanna take the time to dig through all the academic evidence that it doesn't work, we talk a little bit about in, in the book why this is not a fantastic strategy for you and why it's not predictable. And once you realize it's not predictable, it's easier to have a, a, a philosophy to take advantage there's a whole, uh, a whole industry, as you well know, of people who get up every single day and grab your eyeballs on the television to tell you the horrible thing is coming or the good thing is coming. But nobody statistically has been able to consistently do that. There's been a few of these guys that really aren't accessible to you, a Ray Dalio, a Paul Tudor Jones, somebody of that nature that have been able to go 20 plus years making money in all these different markets, but their funds are closed. So you're not gonna be able to get into them. So anybody who's promoting that it, it either Either they believe what they're saying and they're wrong, or they do it long enough until they're right. I mean, we talk about, we show examples in the book of people that there's one man who predicted 2008. The only problem is he's incorrectly predicted 2002, 2003, yeah. 2004, 2005. If you keep saying it eventually, you'll be right. Well, no, exactly course, right. And the greatest investors, many of the greatest investors of all time, don't believe in market timing. So yes. Buffett is not a market timer. You don't see him leave the market and go to cash. You see him 99% invested all the time. And when the market is correcting, he looks for value. He doesn't try to time it, he buys, he waits. He says it doesn't have to matter if he's gonna wait a month or two years, eventually the stock price will match the value of that company. So you can be at one of the greatest investors of all time, uh, whether you're JP Morgan, who when asked, you know, what's the stock market gonna do? He said, it's gonna fluctuate, right? So you look at JP Morgan, you look at Buffett, greatest investors of all time, they're not market timing. So if you're like a 42 year old uh, guy working with an advisor down the street in Walnut Creek, California, who's telling you you can market time, forget it. This just, <laughs> that scenario is not gonna work for you. Just move on. Yeah. So that's a great uh, segue to freedom fact number four, which is I think something that, that people forget or don't know and is extremely reassuring. The fact that despite short term setbacks, historically the stock market rises over time. Yeah, the market's up three out of four years, so 77% of the time, but that's over one year. Over three years, it's up about 90% of the time. Over five years, it's up more than 95% of the time. Over 10 years, it's 98.5% of the time. So in the short run, like Tony was mentioning earlier, incredibly unpredictable. In the long run, it's extremely predictable. We know what the market's gonna do over time. Not just the stock market, but the bond market. Over the long run, we have an expected return uh, that, that comes about that, that we can count on, at least with a reasonable amount of probability and plan, and plan towards. Right. 
But for some reason, people don't easily think about the long term. Well, right, I think that's with the short term. I, I think part of it's this this myth that people believe they hear the market goes up and down. That's not true. The market goes up. What it has is it has intermediate periods where it's down, kind of like inflation goes up and down, right? Sometimes a candy bar goes down in price. Doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. Maybe you stock up on candy bars then. But over time, we all have the expectation as reasonable people that 10 years from now, a Coke is going to cost more, a candy bar is going to co cost more, a house is going to cost more. Uh, if you believe that, then you should believe that about the stock market because part of the return is just inflation. But, Tony, part of this is about psychology, right? Sometimes, for some reason, we focus more on the negative events than we do on the long-term positive ones. So even though, and I think this is freedom fact number five, that historically bear markets only happen every three to five years, for some reason they seem to make an, an over large impression on investor psychology. Well, I don't care. You know, I was talking to Jack Bogle, who started Vanguard, you know, $3 trillion in assets. And he said, I said, what are you doing to Mark? Mark? I goes, I read all my books and remind myself <laughs> not to sell anything. Because right. it's, it's it, yes, it happens. Let, let's just say the figure so everybody understands it. Since 1900, so 115 years, we've had 34 bear markets. Uh, since 1947, we've had 14. So Overall, in 115 years, it's averaged every three years. In the last you know, 50 years or so, it's an average about one every five years. But the problem is that the average drop is 33%, right? And uh, you know, roughly a third of the time, the market drop is 40% or more. Well, when you lose, yeah. at least on paper, in your head, that's still the part of our brain that allows us to go into fight or flight, that survival mechanism, is triggered by money issues. They've done MRIs and shown it as if you were literally, your life was being threatened. And so when that happens, unless you train yourself to be unshakable, unless you know, hey, look, this happens every three to five years. And if I try to get out, as we're gonna show you in a few moments, I'm gonna have the wrong timing. I just need to stay in and I won't lose anything. It'll look like I've lost, but over the long term, if I'm willing to stick with it, I can make it happen because we know what the returns are afterwards. We know how the market jumps after we've taken this hit in a bear market. Everybody remembers where were we in 2009? Where are we today? But what's really important to know is that in the midst of all this, these bear markets last on average a year. There's a few times when they're a couple of years, but usually on average, it's a year. So a year really is any other business. If you could get a Ferrari for 50% off, you would be pretty excited, right? <laughs> but this so. is the stock market's the only place in the world when things go on sale where people freak out. And what you want to be is the unshakable. When everyone else is in turmoil, you want to go, this is the greatest opportunity in my life. Let me get these things now because they're going to go back up in value. Because historically, that's what's happened in the U.S. markets for 200 years, two centuries. No matter what you do, American business seems to find a way to resolve and become more profitable. Whatever you do, part of that is our population grows. Part of that is inflation. And so the combination of these factors and our increased productivity as a society, which keeps growing, especially with technology, allows these markets to continue to grow. So it's going to happen every three to five years. It's going to be a 33% drop, a 40, 50% drop. But what we're going to show you in this book is how to set up a portfolio, how to diversify so that when that happens, you don't take that kind of a hit. You're still in really great shape. But more importantly, as Peter proved with all of his clients during that time, let's go in and let's take advantage of this. This is the chance to leapfrog from wherever you are financially to where you really want to be because this is where you're going to see the greatest growth. I don't remember the exact number. I apologize. But I remember when I was doing research, Everybody remembers Jack Kennedy, obviously, but Joe Kennedy, his father, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the exact number. I apologize. I have to look it up. But he, his level of wealth was sizable. It was like three or four million, if I remember correctly, in 1929. But by 1932, it was more than 100 million. And the reason is because when things melt down, that is the opportunity. When everybody's scared, that's Warren Buffett. That's all the greatest investors in the world. And you can free yourself from the fear when you go, this is it. There's a big winter about every three to five years. Yeah. But winter doesn't last forever. And what always follows winter is springtime, right? This incredible growth. That's really the essence of this. So let's actually, let's talk about springtime, which brings us to freedom fact number six. And I think this is... Uh, a fact that is often forgotten in the midst of those bear markets when you're seeing that 30, 40% paper loss, it's hard to remember uh, that bear markets become bull markets and pessimism becomes optimism. Yes. That's what happens not 90% of the time, but 100% of the time. And I think that's the hard thing for people to grasp. You know, Tony was talking about the frequency of bear markets. There's, 
there's two things that make that particularly troublesome for a lot of investors. And one is it happens every three to five years, but not necessarily spaced out like that, yeah. right? Sometimes you have a tech bubble and then 9-11 and you're going, geez, I just went down 40 whatever percent, I recovered, now I get hit again 40 something percent, I'm just not doing this anymore. Well, that's obviously a spectacular mistake because we know what's happened since then, the market's up 10,000 plus points. Uh, same thing with 08, 09. If you look at March 9 of 2009, the market bottomed. From then, it, it was up 65% over the next few months. When it turns, it turns very rapidly. So I think, I think part of it is this: that they're not the bear markets don't space themselves out. Sometimes they come so fast they freak people out. Sometimes five years passes, and like right now, many of my clients, some of my clients will say, "Well, we're due for a bear market." Well, it doesn't work like that. There have been periods in history where we go 10 or 15 years. Yeah. We just don't know what's going to happen. Is it going to be terrorism? Is it going to be an industry bubble? Is it something we're not we're not thinking about uh, that's going to drive those those things? But regardless, the economy is resilient. People have this perception that capitalism is fragile and the economy is fragile, and it's in fact it's it's quite the opposite. And and, and the market is a function of dividends, it, which we're, get paid in bear markets still. It's a function, a little bit of inflation, and then of over time rising profits. And so what's happened in every single bear market in history is those things have prevailed and the market's gone on to a new high. So let's say you're the worst investor in the world. You put all your money in the market the day before the crash in, in uh, late 07, that starts in late 07. You put all your money in before 9-11 or the tech bubble. Well, we were talking about the average bear market being 33%. These happen to be three of the worst bear markets of all time, mm -hmm. and they're fresh on everyone's minds. Well, if you put all your money 100% in stocks then, well, today you're infinitely wealthier, right? So it's that hard to screw up if you're educated and you have the discipline and you take advantage of the opportunity. If you get in the game and stay in the game, yeah. that's the biggest challenge for people, of course. That's right, and I think that that brings us to a fact um, that I, I think is incredibly important um, and that people really don't realize or appreciate or just plain forget. Your freedom fact number seven, the greatest danger is actually being out of the market. Now, this is totally counterintuitive, right? Because everybody says, look, the ideal would be you get in at the right time and go up, and then you get out before it goes down. But, you know, no one's ever been able to predict that of the best of the best of the world. But here's the fact that will blow your mind. J.P. Morgan did a study and Schwab, both independently did studies over 20-year periods of time. So 1996 to 2015. And they found that on average, if you're in the S&P 500, you have an 8.2% return, which compounding over time is extraordinary for people. It helps you get to that wealth. But in those 20 years, if you just miss the 10 best trading days, 10 days out of 20 years, and your return would be 4.5%. It would literally almost be cut in half just by missing those 10 days. How are you gonna know in 20 years which of those 10 days are? Give me other statistics of what happens with, with <laughs> well, I, 20 I think, days. I think one of the big misperceptions is, okay, if the, if the market's at 10,000, like it was a few years ago, and I wait, well, what, what, what are there only three things that can happen if I'm in cash? One is the market goes down. I feel great, but am I gonna go in at 9,000? Do I really feel great about the market at 9,000 if I didn't feel good at 10? I still have not met that investor in my you know, long career. Second, it goes sideways. I lose. Dividends are better than being in cash or a CD. Third, it goes up. Now, the problem with it going up is it might not come back to 10,000. It might do exactly what it did. Go to 11, 12, 13, 15, 19, 9, you know. You lost and your opportunity. You, you've lost your opportunity. Now, if I go in, there's three things that can happen. It goes up. I'm high-fiving uh, everyone around me. It can go sideways. I'm better than cash. It can go down. Big deal. I can buy more or I wait it out. That's the worst thing in the world that happens is I wait it out. So being out, it's like Tony said, it's counterintuitive. Being out is what results in permanent loss. Being in the worst outcome that can happen, and it's still a low probability event, is temporary loss of capital. So uh, Peter, isn't it also true that those advisors who are not fiduciaries, mm -hmm. who are brokers, they will make money whether they're encouraging you to buy or sell. So they actually have a disincentive to advise you, hey, don't do anything, stay the course, you're going to be fine. I think it's when you're in the brokerage world, you just don't know how anyone's being compensated. And if they disclose it to you, usually there will be conflict. Sometimes they get paid commissions, so there's an, an, an incentive for activity. Sometimes they get paid a fee, but only if you're in certain asset classes. So there's an incentive for you to be in those asset classes. Sometimes they get paid different fees in different asset classes. So there's an incentive for you to take risks you might not want to take. And those and, incentives have nothing to yeah. do with your best interest. It's right. just the incentives of what makes the most money for they the might, corporation. Yeah, they might have their own bond desk. They might have their own mutual funds. They might have their own hedge funds. I mean, so. I think the key is you want to have an advisor. You pay a fee, 
And that fee is the same on all of the investment advice all of the time. And we, if you can get yourself to that, which, I mean, like Tony said at the top of, the, of this, that's extremely rare, unfortunately, in this profession. But if you can find somebody whose investment fee is the same, no matter what they do, what, no matter what they recommend, that's the best case scenario in terms of at least having an alignment before we even get to the next steps with advisor. And I want you to know, I, I give the 10 days, but let me give them the second statistic that they found. In those 20 years, if you're out of the market 20 days, the 20 best days, right. your 8.2 drops to 2.1. You might as well have your money in a treasury or something of that nature, right? And if you miss the top 30 days in 20 years, you lost money. And so it, how are you ever going to time that? And then the, the best fact that we found was extraordinary, and this is done by JP Morgan. They found that six of the 10 biggest trading days, upsides, were within two weeks of the 10 worst trading days. Yeah. So it's like when people's guts are being ripped right. open, that's when the greatest explosion of opportunity happens. We're up how far now, Peter? I haven't seen the latest statistics from where we were in 2009. How much has the growth been on the market? I've forgotten the I number. I mean, I'm looking at the Dow under 7,000, now near 20,000. So you have several hundred percent with dividends. It's, and look at crazy. all the people that yeah. are, have sat out because they were afraid the market's going up and down. Where's the, where's the money going to go? The Terrible. market can't last this long. Every story that you hear, and what really kills me is, I, I guess it's two extremes. It's millennial because they're just not in the market, right? They've been, they're like the generation that went through the Great Depression. They saw what happened to their families and to their parents and some of them to themselves that they're the leading edge of that. And they're just staying out of the market. And they're the core years where they could, with a very small amount of money, become financially free because of the power of compounding with time. And then you got baby boomers that have been sitting out. They can't afford to set out at this time, but they don't know how to get a plan together that can protect them in the worst situations. They don't have to be fearful and they don't know how to take advantage of it. That's what Unshakable is really teaching. And, and not everybody wants to you know, get totally loaded. Some people right. have just accomplished what they want to accomplish and they want to lead a good life. And I have three people just off the top of my mind in my firm that I, Tony's met, uh, two of them personally, who got into this profession because their parents were wiped out. Uh, one in the tech bubble and uh, one after 9-11 with their advisor. And people think about all these decisions they have to make. Really, the biggest one is who's advising you. Yeah. Because the second you, you hand over, you think about all the time you spend earning every dollar you've ever worked for, that you've had the opportunity to save, that you weren't spending on kids' events and food and, and everything else, and you go hand your life's work, whether it's 500000 or $1.8 million or whatever it is to that advisor, but that advisor better be aligned. It's not enough for you to be knowledgeable. They have to be aligned with you, or, or that one decision can really unravel everything else. And one of the things we did in Unshakable is we actually built uh, a set of checklists for you. So whoever you're dealing with, here's the checklist for your lawyer. Here's the checklist for your financial advisor, the questions to ask. So A, you can make sure they're on your side and B, to make sure they're truly executing and the philosophy is really there. But what I really want people to know, I have to agree, 60% of people surveyed today say they believe their financial advisor is putting the company's interest ahead of their own. It's worse than what they perceive in real numbers, and, right? And you would think 60% is high, but yeah. it's not high enough. Unfortunately, it's not. And so one of the reasons that I decided to partner with Peter, I mean, I'm part of the firm, so obviously if you become a client of ours, I benefit you know, financially. But I did this because this is the one guy that, you know, for, as I should say, the Barron's has said three times in a row, here's your number one guy. You, you see CNBC saying two years in a row, he's number one. You look at this year, and again, you got Forbes making him number one. There's a reason. It's a combination of the pure integrity, but also he educates. That's why we're partners. He gets people to understand. So you're not just trusting your financial advisor to figure it out. Educate you and your wife in a way where you, or husband, in a way where you really know what this means and where you're able to take action. And what I'm really grateful for now is this has been for millionaires or a billionaire. Now you've got it for the average person who's on the journey. If they've got at least $100,000, he'll do it. But he'll also do um, a, a, just a, an opportunity for you to have an evaluation, to take a look at what's happening now, a second opinion from the number one rated firm. And if people want to do that, they can go to secondopinion.com. Yeah. And if you go there, Peter has a team and he built the division. So it doesn't matter how little or how much you have, they'll lay out a plan. They'll give you the feedback. And if you want to go implement on yourself, you're welcome to. If you want to do business with Peter, you're welcome to. But uh, I, I'm real, I want to empower people. When I wrote the first book, my biggest challenge was people do need someone. They can do it on their own. But most people, and, it's, and as you have more money, it becomes even more important, have someone to advise them. I wanted to be able to recommend somebody that I could feel 100% by, and I want to recommend somebody that not only I believe is the best, but the financial press believes the press, and that do that with somebody who has integrity and then looks at your entire life 
I mean, and gives you, what, is it seven people now? Is that how many people? Yeah, like, seven you, and then explain, several. Would you explain that? Too. So it's a, what we had before, before Tony came along was we had a group that family office for people that were ultra wealthy and we still have that group and it's doing very well. And we had a group that served that millionaire, multimillionaire next door. We provided family office services to them where they've got this core team of advisors from a legal to tax to asset protection, risk management, um, obviously money management, financial planning, and then other specialists uh, as well. And Tony, as he said, wanted us to bring that to people who had a hundred thousand to 500,000. And we've have a group now that uh, is dedicated to that team. And I mean, that, that marketplace has responded very favorable. To, I don't know that a family office of this caliber has been available to a group like that no, before. No, I think that's right. As somebody who covers this, this industry, what you're talking about, offering that range of services to folks at that uh, level of wealth, $100,000, um, is uh, maybe unprecedented. And, and not charging 2% or 3%, but what's the average now, 80, yeah. 85 our, basis points? Our average points? client pays about 85 basis points in our fee schedule. Uh, ranges from 1.2 down to 0.25, de depending on the wealth. And anyone can go to getasecondopinion.com, and we would match them up with an advisor who will take a look at their situation and, and walk them through our ideas. Great. Tony Robbins and Peter Maluk, I want to thank you both. This has been a fascinating conversation. I know we're going to be talking about it more in subsequent podcasts. We've been talking about Unshakable, your financial freedom playbook, creating peace of mind in a world of volatility. Thanks to both of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, it's Tony Robbins. Listen, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Unshakable podcast. It's the companion to my new book, Unshakable, your financial freedom playbook, creating a peace of mind in a world of volatility. And it's co-authored with my dear partner, Peter Malouk. Listen, by listening to this series, along with reading the book, you'll be armed with all the essential facts and strategies you need to help transform your financial life. So if any of the ideas here you've heard today have struck a chord with you, and you're interested in getting a second opinion on your own financial plan or create one if you don't have one, then please go to getasecondopinion.com. That's getasecondopinion.com to have a creative planning advisor take a look at your portfolio or again, help you to create a plan. It's completely complimentary, completely free, and there's no commitment necessary. I'd also personally love it if you'd leave a review of this podcast on iTunes. I'd love to know what you thought of the program and also, I'd love to hear any new questions you have, any takeaways you took from the podcast. And if you want to share any success stories about your own journey towards financial freedom, we'd certainly love to hear about it. For more information about my book and some more related articles, videos, and other information that can help you to create that unshakable state and achieve the financial freedom you want, go to unshakable.com and know that 100% of this book's profits are being donated Feeding America 45 million people in this country every night don't know where their next meal is going to come from. 17 million are children. And your contribution to this book, 100% of those profits are going to feed them. We'll feed 50 million people this book and we'll feed another 50 million, 100 million next year alone, just with the additional bonuses that I'm offering, the additional benefits I'm getting feeding America as well. So thanks for being my partner and live strong, live with passion, and we'll hear you and meet you on the next podcast. The Unshakable podcast was produced in collaboration with wealth management firm Creative Planning. It is hosted by Richard Bradley, editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine, and features business and life strategist Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk of Creative Planning. This podcast is produced and distributed by Robbins Research International, copyright 2017. What does it really mean to be unshakable? It's not just a matter of money, it's a state of mind. When you're truly unshakable, you have an unwavering confidence amidst the storm. It's not that nothing upsets you, we all get hooked at times, but you just don't stay there. Nothing rattles you for any length of time. This state of mind allows you to be a leader, not a follower, to be the chess player, not the chess piece, to be one of the few who do, not the many who talk. Hi, this is Richard Bradley, the Editor-in-Chief of Worth Magazine. I'm back with Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk uh, talking about Unshakable, their new book, Your Financial Freedom Playbook, Creating Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. Uh, Peter and Tony, welcome back. Thanks for having us. This yeah. next episode will pull back the curtain on a lot of industry practices that, uh, uh, frankly, a lot of people in the industry would, would rather not talk about. You guys don't pull any punches when you're talking about the hidden fees and the half-truths that much of the financial world perpetuates. So let's go ahead. Let's rip off the Band-Aid on what I know is going to be some surprising, uh, maybe even astonishing 
material for our listeners? Well, let, let's start with most people at this stage, and if they listen to our first podcast, know you want to be in the market, right? And so you'd seem it might be simple. Put yourself in low-cost index funds might be the description a lot of people tell me, and a lot of journalists even say to me, isn't that just the solution? And I'd say, yeah, that's part of the solution, but let's look at reality. Reality is that most individuals are putting their money in the market. They're usually doing it through a mutual fund. And if you look at, you know, Dalbar did a great research study. They said a 30-year study from 1985 to 2015, and they said, you know, what did the S&P 500 do? That's easy to calculate, 10.28%. So you're doubling your money about every seven years. With that kind of yeah. compounding, that's how people become wealthy. That's how they get financially free. The only problem is they fortunately figured out what the average investor actually made, and they didn't make the 1028 And the reason is because, and the number they got was 3.66%. Huge difference. Gigantic. Now you're doubling every 20 years as opposed to every 10 years. To give you an idea, over that period of time, if you're compounding through time, $50,000 compounding at 10.28, you're going to have just under a million dollars, 941,000. 3.66%, you're going to have $146,000, not a million. It's mind boggling what happens. So why the discrepancy between what the market offered and what the average investor got? The answer to that is two things, fees and fears. Right? We've talked a little about fears in the last podcast, so if you haven't watched it, I hope you will. But we're going to talk about fees here because fees can destroy your financial future. You can do everything right. You can make all the right investments, be all in the right piece, and you're, you got your financial boat moving towards you know, your ultimate goal, and you got not a hole in your boat, you got half the boat missing if the fees are too high because these fees really play a role. So, of course, you got to pay for fees. But the ideal, if someone is really giving you fiduciary advice, is 1% or less. Right. Numbers above that are really destructive to you. You know, Jack Bogle explained it to me best. He said, Tony, look, if a person only got a 7% return in the marketplace, in say, the stock market, and they, they have an investing lifetime of 50 years, he said, Tony, what happens is each one of those dollars, because of compounding, at the end of that time would be worth 30. For every dollar you invest, you'd have 30. But that's based on 7%. Average fees, according to Bogle, are 2%, not 1%. So that additional 1% is destroying your financial future because it compounds. And he said, so now every dollar you have now, instead of being $30 at the end, it's worth 10. Still a huge growth. But what did you get for it? Nothing. <laughs> His argument is nothing. And so now you find yourself in a position where you've given up two-thirds of the benefit. And to somebody who did what? They went and picked these stocks. We've proven, not we, it's been proven time and time again. Everybody from Warren Buffett talked about this. I interviewed you know, 50 of the smartest people in the financial markets, and they all made it crystal clear. There's no way after fees that someone who's going to go pick the right group of mutual funds, the right set of stocks to put into this group, after fees and after trading costs, after all the things that are there, they don't match the market. In fact, the statistics are mind-boggling. 96% of all mutual funds, which is where you know, actively managed mutual funds is where most human beings put their money to try and grow it, 96% of them fail to match the market or match the index over any 10-year period of time. Now, some people say, I'm smart. And, you know, I'm going to figure out the 4%. I'm going to find that best. The only problem is the 4% is always changing. Nobody sticks around. And I just want to give you one statistic for those watching that just blew my mind. Have you played, do you play blackjack? Sure. Yeah, okay. So if you've ever played blackjack, 21, the goals get to 21. Don't go over if you bust. So if you get two face cards worth 20 and your inner idiot says, hit me, <laughs> you have an 8% chance of getting you know, an ace. Right? You only have a 4% chance of getting the right mutual fund. So you really have to understand that fees control your future. And if you are paying 2% or 3%, you're in trouble. The average mutual fund, according to Forbes, is 3.12%. That means you're giving up 2% more than you should, which is 20 years of future retirement income, and you've given up for what? It's just crazy. Maybe you can elaborate on some of those fees. Yeah, if you look at that breakdown of Forbes, you know, a lot of people say, well, I thought mutual funds were free. Obviously, they're not free. Nothing is free. But you know, most people are sophisticated enough. They go Google it. They see the expense ratio, and the expense ratio says, hey, this fund might be 1% or a little more than 1%. But in reality, there are other costs, too. And that's what Forbes was, you know, been covering their article. You know, one, there's a tax cost, which averages around 1%. There's cash drag, because the mutual fund manager is holding cash because people redeem. He's got to be able to give them cash when they redeem, or he might be looking for opportunities. He might also be emotional and be playing, playing defense, but 
almost all mutual funds carry a, a good enough amount of cash that the average mutual fund's paying about 0.83 in cash drag. So uh, almost costs. 1%. That might be good for them, but it isn't good for you. You're not getting the benefit of being in the market. Right? That's right. And then the transaction costs, uh, most of them are not reflected in the expense ratio. You got another 1.4% or so. So you start to look at the transaction costs, the expense ratio, the tax costs, uh, and you put Here, all this stuff together and it and becomes tough, tough hurdle if, to get if over. If people wanted to, how would they even know how to find out about these fees? I know just finding out what the expense ratio, which is what most people think is the bottom line cost of a mutual fund. Even seeing that is not always easy for people. Most people don't know or they don't take the time to look. But these other fees that you're talking about, how would people even find out about them if, well, they, have, if they have, wanted to? Have fun being the one person to read a prospectus to, to, find, <laughs> to find most of them. Well, on top of that, even when people look up their funds, they often don't realize there's multiple versions of that share class with different fees and rules associated with them. And this is not... This is from companies like Vanguard all the way um, to you know, all kinds of much more expensive companies. They have varying ways, uh, various minimums, various fees, various entry points and exit points for their funds. It becomes a, a very difficult deal to mine. But we know a couple things. We know what Tony was saying. We can't find that 4%. So there's research that, hey, most of these people that are performed, that, that 96%. percent of, of active uh, mutual yeah. fund managers who beat the market. That's over over 15 about. years, it's about 4% that'll beat it. But we don't know who will do it the next 15 years. So there's no research showing, in fact, the research shows quite the opposite. If you find those 4% and you bet on them, they're more likely to underperform. Just like if you buy one star rated, one, one star morning star rated mutual funds, the probability is you'll do better than if you buy the five star rated ones. So we know past performance doesn't indicate, but there is a direct correlation between fees and performance. So you can map out the most expensive mutual funds against the least expensive, the least expensive will be in the top quartile. The most expensive, for the most part, will be in the bottom quartile. So it's a big indicator. David Swenson, who uh, is the, the uh, chief investment officer at Yale, took them from $1 billion, which it took him almost 200 years to get to, to $25 billion in less than 20 years. He's considered the institutional superstar in institutional investing, said to me that mutual funds charge absorbent fees for a shocking disservice to investors. And he does not pull punches. He says it's insane for you to invest in an actively managed mutual fund because when you take all these additional costs in there, there's just no way they can consistently beat the market. So all you're doing is giving up your income to someone who's not doing you a service of any sort. It sounds shocking. It sounds absurd. But it's even worse than the 401k industry. I mentioned in the other podcast, for 30 years, that industry, which is a $6 trillion industry, there's 90 million Americans that have a 401k. More people have a 401k than have a home, to give you an idea. But for 30 years, they didn't have to tell you what they charge you. So they just took fees. Some of those fees can be as much as 4%. You could say, I want to invest in an index fund, and many of them won't offer it. But even the ones that do sometimes have a sales load of 3% up front. 3% to get in the game for something that costs 0.05%, five, you know, five one hundredths of a percent, five basis points, right? So it's just crazy the world we live in. And every one of those 1% is above that first 1% that you've got to pay or less that's a decade of income. So if you're paying 2% more, that's two decades of income and you got nothing for it. It's nuts and it can only happen because there's no transparency. And what we've done with this Unshakable book is bring you that transparency and show you exactly what it is. And that's also what Peter's firm does is looks at it and shows you exactly what it is. They read the forms, they figure it out yeah. for you. So let me see if I understand this. The situation is most people think that they can beat the market. Yeah. In reality, most people substantially underperform the market Massively. because they either make the wrong bets or because of the cost of fees. Yeah. And the truth is that really, for most people, what wouldn't be so bad is to actually match the market and pay as little in fees as you can. That's right. And not, and, and not only to just elaborate on what you said, it's not most people, it's not like we're talking the average person. Most professionals mm -hmm. yeah, are, are underperforming for, for the exact same reasons. So you, you can look over at, at index funds as one of the potential solutions. If you look at the actively managed mutual fund world, it used to really exist you know, back in the 80s. Uh, we didn't have high-speed internet access, and we needed an investment vehicle available to the everyday person. The more sophisticated higher net worth uh, investors, they were at places like creative planning, where we might use private equity, we might use indexes, we might use some individual securities in certain spaces. Well, now that's become more accessible to right. to everybody and even creative planning we had lowered our minimum all the way to 500,000 tony came along and said hey if i'm going to be a part of this you got to make it 100,000 that shows you where the market's moving there's just no place for paying you know 2% for any uh, anything other than some pretty sophisticated investments on the private equity space and things like that but for the typical person 
there's just no place for those sorts of funds anymore. And as you guys point out in Unshakable, it's not just fees that you have to worry about, right? With actively managed funds, there's also the question of taxes. There is. I mean, you can, you can invest in a mutual fund in December. This is how crazy the tax situation is. And that person, the person who's the manager of that fund might decide to sell that particular asset, right? That particular stock, whatever it is. And when they sell it, there's taxes due. You held it for two weeks, and you're going to pay the year's right. worth of taxes on it. And you're in the hole to start with. This is common. No one said the tax laws are fair. They're just, they are the tax laws. So if you're unaware of this, one of the biggest things we talk about is tax efficiency because it's everybody loves to quote what the return's going to be. But, you know, if you know the Vogel example, if you were getting 7%, but you're paying 2% in fees, you're really emitting 5%. The difference in compounding is that difference between $1 equal 30 versus $1 equal 10. Let me give you a, a simple example. Let's say you have two people that are 35 years old and they've accumulated $100,000 over their entire life and they're gonna invest that 100,000 and nothing else again. And they're gonna leave that money in the stock market, say for 30 years till they're 65 years old. Well, at 65 years old, if you paid 3% in fees, 3.12 is the average according to Forbes, you got $432,000. So your 100 went to four, it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. But if you paid 1% in fees, your 100,000 went to $761,000. I mean, here's the other big difference. If you're taking away, say, $60,000 a year for your retirement, the person who got $432,000, it's gonna last till they're 79, and the average lifespan's 85 plus. So what's the biggest fear everybody has today, baby boomers especially, is they're afraid, I'm gonna run, they're not afraid of death. Death is way down low, <laughs> number two. Number one is living without any money, being yeah. totally broke, right? And it's gonna happen to them. The person that you know only had 1% in fees, they're gonna last till they're 92 years old on that same amount of money, and they can take more money per you know, year for their income. So these people have to understand, when you hear a 1% number, you know, what's 1%, 2% right. amongst friends. <laughs> you know? sure. But those 1% and 2% and 3% numbers can be the difference between whether you're gonna be financially free or you're gonna have to work full time at Walmart in old age, you know, being a greeter or something that's insane. Nobody should have to do, they wanna do that, that's totally different, but that's having right. to do that because someone else got all these fees is just unacceptable. So our goal is blow open the door and show people the truth. Once people know the truth, it's so easy to put yourself in a position where those fees disappear and yet you get greater returns. The worst part is these guys overcharge for underperformance. And it's a fact, it's not an opinion that we're expressing. It's you know, studies at Yale, studies in the book, we fill it with studies so you know this, nothing here is opinion. This is all unassailable because it's coming from the greatest investors on the face of the earth and the studies that the universities have done. Yeah, it's not what you make, it's what you keep after doubt. taxes and fees. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at two different investment options, and one has higher fees and one has higher taxes, it better be extremely compelling. And yes, with the ultra affluent, sometimes there are those things. There's the private equity thing. But for 99% of people, you've got a couple of million dollars to invest down to $100,000 to invest. You should be looking at those two factors a, a, a hell of a lot. Peter, I was interested in the book. You mentioned that for the vast majority of your clients, you actually discourage investments in hedge funds because of the fees, right? the 2% fee, uh, management fee, and 20% fee on any profits that- and some charge that even make, more that today. And stuff. some charge even more. Tony, you've, you've talked in the past about how there are a handful of extremely successful hedge fund managers, uh, yes. but that you, you can't probably get into those funds yes. now. Um, Peter, talk a little bit about, about why you guys made that decision that, that hey, this is an investment option that for most people is just not appropriate. You know, I think it's confusing to people because we're not against alternatives. So there are a variety of asset classes and we invest in most of them. So we like bonds, we like stocks, uh, energy, real estate, um, and we like private equity, for example, as one of many alternatives we use for our higher net worth, more sophisticated clients. But to me, hedge funds isn't really an asset class. Hedge funds is, we're trading in the stock market, just like a mutual fund person is. And the mutual fund person is hurt by cash drag, by taxes, by fees, by transaction costs. That same set of, of uh, problems does not go away if you rename yourself a hedge fund manager and change your fee schedule. The same thing follows you, which is why eight of the last nine years, the typical hedge fund has underperformed the index. Mm -hmm. Average person would pay less in fees and less in taxes to outperform simply owning an index. And that's why you know, as a group, not a fan of hedge funds. Is there an anomaly on, on, that, on that side, just like there is with Warren Buffett on the, on the stock side? 
Of course there is. But when we're looking at as a marketplace, the odds are we're going to lose by adding exposure to that space. When I talked to Warren Buffett and interviewed him, uh, you know, he tells everybody when he passes, his money is all going in index funds. His whole component is don't pay all these fees. It's the one thing that you can control. But he made a bet with protege partners and said, you can pick five of the best you know, hedge funds that exist, and I'm going to pick the index, and we're going to do a 10-year bet. It was a million dollars, I think it was, a million dollar bet. And he said, we'll see who's winning. And Warren is and winning he's by a, him, by, yeah. he's just destroying him. <laughs> we're like, what, are they eight years into it now or yeah, nine years into it? Yeah, that sounds about right, but it's They're like it's eight and a half years yeah. into it. And they're not even in the same league. Right. So, you know, it, it really comes down to being smart on fees and being smart on taxes. And one of the reasons I was so excited about Peter is that, you know, if you go to a broker and brokers are called you know wealth managers financial man there's a zillion there's i think 200 names for brokers mm -hmm. now that sound a whole lot more attractive but they can't advise you legally on taxes and neither can most even registered investment advisors mm -hmm. what's unique about peter is he has the cpas on staff assigned to you so instead of me trying to decide is this a good investment and someone recommending it in a vacuum we know what that's going to mean to me overall because you know, someone says I got an eight percent return, but if their real net is four percent, which is what it is if you're at fifty percent and you sell within the year or you own a mutual fund, they're constantly turning things over. You're paying a fifty percent tax instead of a twenty percent capital gains tax. You're paying thirty percent more. Talk yeah. about changing your compounding and changing your world. But again, most people don't have that advice. It's separate. They got to go get yeah, it. Yeah, I know, Peter. Here. Peter, uh, in uh, in the world of the ultra high net worth, you know, people who are worth tens of millions of dollars, they'll have a family office or a whole team of people to give yeah. that kind of advice. Um, but and, you and guys I, do it for a lot less. And for, I know because we are people. that family office for a lot of those folks. So I personally work with a lot of clients, and our firm works with hundreds of clients that fit that bill of tens of millions or hundreds of million or hundreds of millions of dollars. And we are their family office, and it is interesting. You know, as Tony talks about the difference between the ultra affluent and, and, and what other people focus on, the ultra affluent, when they're interviewing us and, and hiring us, they're asking me questions about keeping, uh, keeping the money that they have, how to grow it in a smart way, but they're asking about fees. They're asking about taxes primarily and the structure of their plan. Um, somebody else might come in, typical American might come in and go, well, show me your performance or how are you going to get me out of the next bear market? They're asking the wrong questions. So you really have to look at it and say, what is my vision? What are my goals? What is it I need to own to hit those goals? And how do I control all the taxes I can, with, whether it's very sophisticated with foundations and trusts and so on, or if it's not that sophisticated, but more sophisticated than most people are, are behaving with markets, which is how do I control the expenses within these funds? How do I own certain investments in an IRA that might be different than in a taxable account? Those are the kinds of things that, that our family office is now bringing to somebody with 100,000, 500,000, or a couple million dollars as well. And if you think about it, you know, people are charging one and two and 3% for nothing but to pick a group of investments and put them together for you to invest in, and say a mutual fund, or you're going to you know, a broker who's charging you along the way, He's charging less than 1%, average of 85 basis points. Average of now. 85 goes from 1.2 down to 0.25, depending on count size. So the numbers are ridiculous, but he's providing tax advice, estate planning advice, legal advice, financial advice, all within that fee. It's, it's, it's been really ridiculous. This is why I decided to partner with him, because you're in the industry. Do you know anybody else doing anything of this nature? Uh, not that I know of, no. But Tony, I want to ask you a question about psychology, right? Yeah. So you're the director of investor psychology at Peter's firm, Creative Planning. And what we've been talking about is actually fairly simple. The rules uh, that, that people, the guidelines that people can follow, yep. the facts that they need to know are fairly straightforward. And yet I can hear people thinking to themselves, you know, for decades I've been hearing, no, I need to invest with this mutual fund manager or no, this is a, I'm, I can beat the market. Yep. How do you overcome that resistance to simplicity? I think you know, most of the people, when they see the facts and the facts are put right in front of them, it's kind of like a detective. You know, there's a pattern of facts. There's just yeah. one fact. You go, eh, I don't know. But we show you 20, yeah. you know, and we show you example after example. When we show people, we don't usually see resistance. When we show people right now, you're paying in your mutual or let's say in your 401k, you've got index funds and you're paying 1.83% for something that costs 0.05%. People go berserk. You can spend $20,000 and buy yourself a Honda Accord, or you could spend a million dollars on a Honda Accord. And there, this is the only industry in the world, the financial industry, where there's you know, no transparency so that the average person doesn't know, my neighbor spent 20 grand, I spent a million. Yeah. I mean, that ratio of difference is the real ratio is there. So I find no difficulty 
and no resistance when you show people the facts. What I did find difficulty is, is when I created a 700 page book, <laughs> some people didn't make it all through it, lots of people loved it, but really this is designed so that you could read it you know, in a weekend or in a day and really have the essentials you need to make decisions that literally will put money in your pocket day one. Because this is all money that's just being leaked from your financial future. It's unfair, it's wrong, and we want to help people change it. And you don't have to do business with us to be able to take advantage of everything here. We've given you the checklist for whoever you deal with so you know exactly what to ask. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be surprised. And we also give you a referral service so you can look at anyone. But obviously, I'm a partner with right. Peter here at, you know, at CPI, at Creative Planning. And our goal is to give people real value. So the thing that we offer people is to give them a second opinion. And we charge nothing for it. There's zero commitment, and anyone can do it. And they call the firm. They go to get a second opinion.com, get a second opinion.com, and they'll do fill this out for you. They'll work with you. They'll walk you through it. And if you want, you can implement it on your own, or you can do business with Peter and his firm. Uh, obviously, I recommend that. I benefit from that because I'm partners in it, but I couldn't recommend enough, and that's why my money's there as well. I think it's just the industry is counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to the typical person. But once you have the opportunity to explain to them what's going on and show them what's going on, they look at things a little differently. You think, if I go to an advisor, I should be put in a better spot, just like I am with an architect, an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer. Not necessarily the case. Most financial advisors don't have to act in your best interests. Even the ones who do often have their own mutual funds or products. So the structure by itself on its face has conflicts. Um, it's just it's counterintuitive. But they have to be educated to know that. You think, in, like with everything, most things in the world, the more you pay, the more you get. It's the opposite with financial services. So, again, it's not hard once you get a chance to explain it, but, you know, it's a busy world. People have a lot going on. Usually they don't take the time to look at their statements or their investments unless something really bad has happened. The biggest inflow of new clients to creative planning was after 9-11, the tech bubble, the 0809 crisis, the, the beginning of 2016 with, during the mini in, energy crisis. That's when people pause and look. But when you get the opportunity to educate them, uh, then they make they make the, the decisions they need to make. That's right. And I think you guys do a great job of this in Unshakable. Tony, I love Money Master the Game, but you're right. It's a big book. Yeah. Uh, this one is very accessible. It's, I think, around 200 pages. Yeah. Um, you guys uh, explain uh, clearly and precisely what we're talking about. And I think what's, what's really compelling about it is that you create action strategies for pe things that people can really do yeah. to, to look at, at the fees that they're paying at their own uh, financial planning situation and make some changes if need be. And we can do it for them if they wanted to, but if, they can also do it for themselves. So nobody's dependent on anybody, but if they want help, we can help them. I'm talking with Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk uh, about their book, Unshakable. Your Financial Freedom Playbook, Creating Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. Gentlemen, we'll be talking more about this in um, uh, subsequent podcasts, but thank you very much. Thanks thank for you. Us again. Hey, it's Tony Robbins. Listen, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Unshakable Podcast. It's the companion to my new book, Unshakable, Your Financial Freedom Playbook, Creating a Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. And it's co-authored with my dear partner, Peter Malouk. Listen, by listening to this series, along with reading the book, you'll be armed with all the essential facts and strategies you need to help transform your financial life. So if any of the ideas here you've heard today have struck a chord with you, and you're interested in getting a second opinion on your own financial plan, or create one if you don't have one, then please go to getasecondopinion.com. That's getasecondopinion.com to have a creative planning advisor take a look at your portfolio, or again, help you to create a plan. It's completely complimentary, completely free, and there's no commitment necessary. I'd also personally love it if you'd leave a review of this podcast on iTunes. I'd love to know what you thought of the program. And also, I'd love to hear any new questions you have, any takeaways you took from the podcast. And if you want to share any success stories about your own journey towards financial freedom, we'd certainly love to hear about it. For more information about my book and some more related articles, videos, and other information that can help you to create that unshakable state and achieve the financial freedom you want, go to unshakable.com. And know that 100% of this book's profits are being donated Feeding America. 45 million people in this country every night don't know where their next meal is going to come from. 17 million are children. And your contribution to this book, 100% of those profits are going to feed them. We'll feed 50 million people this book, and we'll feed another 50 million, 100 million next year alone, just with the additional bonuses that I'm offering, the additional benefits I'm getting Feeding America as well. So thanks for being my partner. And live strong, live with passion, and we'll hear you and meet you on the next podcast. The Unshakable Podcast was produced in collaboration with wealth management firm Creative Planning.
It is hosted by Richard Bradley, editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine, and features business and life strategist Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk of Creative Planning. This podcast is produced and distributed by Robbins Research International. Copyright 2017. What does it really mean to be unshakable? It's not just a matter of money, it's a state of mind. When you're truly unshakable, you have an unwavering confidence amidst the storm. It's not that nothing upsets you, we all get hooked at times, but you just don't stay there. Nothing rattles you for any length of time. This state of mind allows you to be a leader, not a follower, to be the chess player, not the chess piece, to be one of the few who do, not the many who talk. Hi, my name is Richard Bradley, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine. Welcome back to the Unshakable Podcast. We're here today to talk about something that, aside from home ownership, is the most common investment for Americans, contributions to employer-sponsored retirement plans. Nearly 90 million Americans are putting away money from their paycheck, with most of them participating in 401k plans. For many, it's the only retirement plan that they have and what they're banking on, literally, to provide financial security in their later years. But as he was writing his first book, Money Master the Game, Tony Robbins discovered that there are some enormous problems with 401ks, problems that were costing Americans a year's worth of retirement income. To write Unshakable, the financial freedom playbook, he took yet another look at the 401k industry with the help of one of his, Tom Zagainer, from America's Best 401k the company that Tony himself uses for his company's 401k plans. Tony's son, Josh Robbins, also joined forces and now serves as chief marketing officer for the company. Welcome, Tom and Josh, to the Unshakable podcast. Thank you. Thanks, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for joining us today, guys. So, Tom, why don't we start with you? Uh, talk about what is the number one problem with most 401k plans today? Well, Richard, as you mentioned at the top, Aside from home ownership, this really is the primary investment vehicle that we're using as Americans to build financial resources to sustain ourselves after our active work life is completed. And with over $6 trillion currently invested in 401k plans, there's going to be an enormous mathematical consequence of the, when there's going to be excessive or perhaps needless fees inside these plans. And while they're not necessarily hidden, we like to say that they're hiding in plain sight because the typical plan participant or plan sponsor really doesn't have a handle on it. And if you look at really for three decades plus, the financial services industry, the companies who are in the business of providing 401k plans, they were not even required by law to disclose how much they're charging their customers. Think about it. Let me you know, I can Tom, because I think that that's worth repeating. For, uh, for decades, the, the people who ran these plans didn't even have to tell the people who were in them what their fees were. It's crazy to think about that we would buy anything in our life in any manner, right? If we went shopping today or we're going to travel today or we're going to buy something today, that we would do it without knowing what it costs. And yet here's the thing we need for when we're 65 to 90 years old. And for all that time, they didn't have to tell us. And even still today, and we'll talk a little bit later um, about the disclosure rules that change things somewhat, still over 70% of participants in 401k plans still believe that there are no associated investment-related costs, which kind of goes to our lack of basic financial acumen, not even understanding that mutual funds or index funds actually have an inherent cost built into it. I think that's an astonishing fact, actually. 71% of people who are enrolled in 401ks do not know that there are any fees involved whatsoever. It's, it's sort of a, you know, you work each week and you have a bi-weekly or semi-monthly and monthly payroll and money comes out of your pay and it goes into your 401k and you occasionally look at your balance and you see it grow and maybe it grows a little and maybe it grows a lot. But the mathematical consequence of the fees mitigating returns over time are not even on the radar. And a lot of these funds that providers have on their core lineup or maybe a broker or payroll company put in place, there can be more than a dozen different fees inside of them that are chipping away at their returns over time. So, Tom, when did that change? When did 401k providers 
become required to provide a fee disclosure? In, um, in July of 2012, after about three years of back and forth legislation um, to try to get a disclosure of some sort brought forth, in July of 2012, a document called a 408B2 was starting to be necessarily provided by plan providers to the plan sponsor. That's the employer version. In August of that year, a different version called a 404A5, a participant disclosure, became into law where each participant in the plan had to receive that disclosure. The problem is that where it should provide clarity, it actually provides more confusion. Providers hide them on their website. They're not easily obtained even when you call the provider. These documents could be 30 to 50 pages long. They're in English, and there's numbers that we've learned from grade school, but when you put it all together, it's a document that makes no sense because there's, right. no, con there's no context to them. You mentioned, uh, you used the phrase hiding in plain sight um, for, for uh, these fees. So if you take uh, all the people who are enrolled in 401ks, and you subtract the 71% of people who don't know that they're fees, there are 29% of people left who do know that they're fees. How many of them, Tom, do you think could even find the fees uh, if once they, once they actually know that the fees exist? Hardly any, uh, and here's why. There's not congruency between the employer version and the participant version. For example, on a participant version, you might see a core fund lineup and their expense ratios. But then there will be verbiage that says additional administrative fees may apply or additional asset-based fees may apply. Contact your administrator. So even if you wanted to try to sit down and find the effects of fees for yourself, it's still not on the document because now you're required to go to your employer. Then the employer starts to dig up their version of it and ostensibly there should be those fees noted there. And then sometimes on their fee disclosure document, it'll say, please refer to your contract to find that fee. So it's even though the services, the financial services industry is appealing to the letter of the law by providing disclosures, man, they're made, making it really difficult for people to come up with the end sum that's affecting them all right. the time. Right. So most people don't know that there are fees. And the people who do know that there are fees find it impossible to find them and know what they actually are. Uh, Tom and Josh, talk a little bit about what these fees mean for the average worker. Like, let's uh, let's start small. Say you've got someone who earns thirty thousand dollars a year and saves five percent of of his or her annual income, which is uh, for someone who's making thirty thousand dollars a year a, a substantial savings, right? That's that's a that's a significant amount of money to put aside. How do these fees affect their savings and their returns? Yeah, this was a this was a, this is a great exercise because again, when fees fees sound small, you you hear one percent or two percent, and you think, does that really make a difference? But when you think about the the impact of those fees over time, that's really what people have to fully understand and and get their arms around. Um, there was a great study by uh, a think tank, bipartisan think tank called Demos, and. Um, uh, there was a gentleman there by the name of Robert Hilton Smith, who's a full PhD, and he's one of the ones who w went on this excursion to try to find how many fees he was paying and what fees he was paying and found out there was over 17 different fees that could be applied in a, in a fee disclosure. And, 17 um, different fees. 17 different fees, yeah. yeah. And, and so he looked at this and said, okay, so what does that really mean to the average worker? So a $30,000 a year employee saving 5%, as, as we said, loses about $154,000 to fees over their lifetime. And that's an astonishing number. But what's more astonishing would be how much more money they would have if, they were to, if that money would have been put to work and was actually compounding. So that's just the fee amount. But if you actually were to say, okay, if that money were put back, what would that have grown to? And, and it really right. means the difference between the ability to retire and the ability not to. Uh, so our general rule of thumb uh, Richard, is that if you look at it over time, a typical market return of 7% uh, over time, a 1% reduction in fees. So someone who's paying 2% versus someone who's paying 1%. All things being equal, they both have the same returns. The person with mm -hmm. the higher fees, their money's going to last uh, 10 years less. Their money's going to run out 10 years earlier than the person with the lower fees with the 1% in fees. 
So and that, yeah. uh, that, I think, is particularly important to think about when you realize that people are living longer these days um, and hoping, hoping to retire sooner. Um, but in fact, what's, what's happening in part because they're worried about being able to support themselves during retirement is they're living longer, but they're also working a lot longer. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, baby boomers, their number one fear is not death. <laughs> and their number one fear is actually running out of money too early. In other words, they'd, sadly to say, they'd rather be right. dead than broke. And um, that's, a, that's yeah. a, it's a very real fear for people. And, um, and so people are, there's this, there's an epidemic in our country in the 401k space of overpaying for underperformance. And that's really what, what, what we have here. And that same study, just to continue that forward, if you are maybe a higher income earner and, and you're listening to this podcast, someone who's making $90,000 a year and say they're putting away, stocking away 5% as well, they're actually going to lose closer to 300000 about $277,000 in fees over their lifetime. Um, but again, if that money would have been working for them, how much more would that 277000 would have compounded to? You know, half a million, three quarters of a million of additional monies they would have had uh, to sustain themselves later in life. So, Tom, what happens? Uh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Josh, but yeah. let me throw a question at, at uh, Tom. So, what happens if I'm a teacher? Uh, so, I'm not using a 401k, but uh, rather a 403b. Isn't that better? It sadly can be far worse. Um, 403b plans, if you compare them to a typical 401k plan, which has a core fund lineup put together by someone, an advisor, a provider, a record keeper, whoever, typically a core fund lineup, one lineup. With a lot of these 403b plans, you'll have multiple providers. So a teacher on 401k day, they may have five or six different investment providers, wildly different companies involved, the completely different perspectives on how they approach things and the funds they offer to choose from. It almost becomes a marketplace. And what we see in a lot of these plans is that the fees are even more excessive than those in 401k plans. You know, one we saw recently where they're charged uh, up to 2% on every bit of savings to manage their plan. For every dollar that goes in, another 6% sales charge, a front-end load, so to speak, is added to it. So think about it. 8% in fees the first year alone. Yeah, that's These crushing. Kind, it's totally crushing. They exist in 401k plans, but candidly, not as egregious as we see in the 403b market. And it's sad, right? These are our educators. You know, a lot of the educators are math educators, and yet the thing that they're teaching is the thing that's actually working against them as they try to plan for their life after active work. And, and if I can mention, you, of course, You're if right I can mention it to, to Josh's point earlier when he talked about you know the fear of baby boomers, you know the adage is out there that we never worry about our money until we do, and it's these little things that we do today that we're not really cognizant of what's going on today, they're going to have a consequence Consequence 20 years from now when we retire, 15 years from when we retire. So it's really a matter of paying attention to keeping your eye on the ball now to see with where that ball is going to land 20 years out. Tom, I know that, that you guys at America's Best can on a lot of research into this subject, a lot of research into – uh, fees, what they are, how to find them, uh, what kind of effect they have upon people's investments and returns. Uh, how, how could people access that information from you all at America's Best 401k? Well, there's a couple of ways to start. Um, we built something unique, our fee checker that's available either at americasbest401k.com or a participant-driven site called itsyourmoney.com where you could enter in the name of your plan this is a database that includes all existing 401k plans in the United States. And it will give you an initial analysis based upon plans similar to yours. So if you have a million-dollar plan, it's comparing you to all the million-dollar plans out there in the United States. It gives you a sample report compared to industry averages. But where we really want to go forward from there, Richard, is to be precise, to be absolute. And that's why we ask either the plan sponsor or the plan participant to send us those fee disclosures I mentioned earlier. That's, so to, that's really the treasure map for us. It provides the optics to provide an accurate diagnosis because the other thing that does not exist in the disclosure documents is that it's not taking into account time. Time is the critical aspect of all here because you can see 1% or 
or this fee or that fee. But until it's put into context of your plan balance or the company's plan balance and annual contributions year after year going forward with that hypothetical return rate that Josh mentioned earlier, 7%, for example, factoring all the expenses, you really have no idea if where you are going is a place you remotely want to end up until you introduce those elements. So that's mm-hmm. what we do for that's what we do for people on a complementary basis. And and uh, Josh, how do people find out you know, sort of the things that their four hundred one k provider doesn't easily tell them? Yeah. So that, there's a um, we we wanted to create a very clear and concise uh, kind of indictment, if you will, across the industry. And there's really, you know, this can this can might sound complex to the listener, but really, there's really about five things that your 401k provider doesn't want you to know or understand. So we built a report to that effect. It's called the five things your 401k provider doesn't want you to know. And it's right there available on the homepage at americasbest401k.com. And so for business owners, it's a fantastic read. For participants, um, you know, spread it around. Spread it around your, your, uh, your colleagues. And uh, if you have access to the ownership and HR of your business, because frankly, it's not, you know, employers are busy, right? They're busy running their business. They're usually just, you know, 401k is a check the box item. No, they're not trying to, uh, you know, they're not, your employer is not making money off you. These are the 401k providers. So the employers have every incentive and desire to want to, to help their employees. They just typically don't know that this is happening either. So it's right. a great, it's a great report to pass along and, and to spread the word. So we, we feel like it's uh it's the best, a lot, a lot of secrets here that we can, if we can get out there and kind of, uh, pull back the curtain, everybody would be better served. And uh, sorry, that's at americasbest401k.com? That's correct, right on the homepage there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the uh, law and the politics around this because those, those are important aspects of this. A lot of folks don't know it, but it's actually, this is actually a subject that Washington has started to focus on in the past couple of years. Um, I remember in early 2015, I think it was, the Obama administration started to get involved with this issue. And uh, it's part of the push toward legislation around a fiduciary standard, which is um, something that that Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk of Creative Planning talk about in another podcast episode. Um, those guys made it clear that that all brokers and advisors working in the retirement space must always be acting in their client's best interest. So that was a, a pretty important change. Let me just repeat that because it is a big deal. All brokers and advisors working in the retirement space must always be acting in their clients' best interests. So the White House Council of Economic Advisors, I saw, issued a report that, uh, quote, hidden fees and backdoor payments are costing Americans more than $17 a year. Have things gotten better since then? It's about two years later now. Tom, do you, I don't, want, to, do you I, want to talk to that? I don't really think so because it's the percentages of, of where are most 401k plans residing. If we think that there's close to 640, 650,000 401k plans out there, most of those are with two national payroll companies, 15 to 20 insurance companies, and a couple of fund companies. The problems are the inherent conflicts of interest. So if, for example, you're a big payroll company, you're using a core list of funds for most of your clients, where the payroll company, simply as a matter of convenience of integration with payroll, is providing these 401k services, might be getting 25 to 75 basis points in revenue sharing from the pay-to-play funds on their platform, with no value exchange occurring. Payroll company, remember, not a fiduciary in any measure. Or through a lot of the broker-driven insurance company models, Now you have multiple layers. You have a broker-dealer that gets paid. The broker gets paid. The fund company gets paid. Often the provider gets paid. How do they get paid? It has to come from either inside the expense ratios of the funds or by adding fees on top. The bottom line is, regardless of fee disclosure, regardless of expected transparency, regardless of putting the needs of the client first, you still have a lot of folks who have determined that this is their 401k plan not the plan participants 401k plan. So these layers of fees are batting added on, on top of it. So it has not improved. We review hundreds of plans every month. Nothing's changing in that model. And Josh, I imagine that inertia has something to do with this, right? A company has set up its 401k plan. 
everything seems to be working fine. No one's complaining because they don't really know uh, how much better they could be doing. So why bother? Just uh, no one's paying any attention to it, right? Absolutely. And that's <clears throat> it's the frog in the boiling water concept, right? I mean, that's really the way that they want it um, is for no one to start asking questions uh, so uh, and start looking around. I mean, even when you ask your provider where, where my fee disclosure is or how do I get a copy of my fee disclosure, that's such a rare question that it even uh, you know raises red flags when when the provider uh, hears this question is why would you need to see your fee disclosure it's just such an unusual such an unusual question so and I think with the you know if to, we're going back to the law for just a quick second um, you know the the DOL law has a tremendous That's number. the Department of Labor yeah correctly sorry the Department of Labor law it really has a number of carve outs and caveats so you know yes they, they the the law which by the way could potentially depending on when you're listening to this uh, be rolled back uh, or postponed uh, by the Trump administration. We're not sure yet. Um, however, what this law does is it says, hey, yeah, you've got to act in your best interest. However, there's a lot of buts attached to it. Uh, you can still create, you can still generate commissions. You can still participate in revenue sharing, which is a fancy word for pay to play, meaning the mutual funds. You ever wonder why the mutual funds on your on your list to choose from you say who selected those and why are why are those the ones if there's thousands of them out there why are there these 15 or 20 or 30 and the reason is so I, I would like to I'd like to think it's because some really smart uh, person somewhere looked at a whole bunch of funds and decided that these were the best ones I, I, I yeah, that's that's ideal um, the problem is, is that the funds that are on that are, are the ones on the shelf are the ones that are paying the most typically to be uh, offered to you so their expenses. But so I'm sorry. Wait a second. I feel like that's a that's a huge point. It is. So huge. the funds that are in your 401k plan aren't there necessarily because they were chosen by the plan administrator on the basis of merit. They're there because the guys who sell the funds are paying to put them in your 401k plan. Absolutely. Yeah. The funds themselves are there, just like if you were to walk into a retail store and those products are on the shelf because. They generate a great margin. Uh, the same is true for uh, mutual funds in your 401k plan. They are paying to be on that platform in 99% uh, of the time, which of course is passed on directly to you in the in the form of increased costs. Uh, so yeah, they, and they can be insanely expensive. So you know, expense ratios. Uh, we've seen expense ratios as high as two and a half, three and a half. Uh, I think our, our record is 5%, a 5% annual expense ratio, which is just astronomical. So, yeah, those they're absolutely paying to be offered. Can I piggyback so off of that? 5% so, means that if – yeah. Well, the crazy part about what Josh just mentioned is that if you have a broker on the plan who's not a fiduciary or a payroll company who's not a fiduciary or you went to some provider that just said you can pick these funds or those funds, they're not a fiduciary. The plan sponsor, the business owner, under ERISA, is a fiduciary, meaning if you have discretion in administering or managing the plan, or you control the plan's assets, like choosing the investment options, or choosing the firm that offers those investments, that business owner is a fiduciary to the extent that's discretionary control over the plan. And further to that is that you may have not been told this as a plan sponsor, but when you, as an ERISA fiduciary, act for the ex called the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to the plan, that person is legally bound to do so at the level of a hypothetical expert. So a business owner probably doesn't know that if they don't appoint a fiduciary, they are one and they're the de facto expert and the ERISA expects you to carry out those functions as if you had the, that professional knowledge. But oh, by so the, the way, they're, they're running their business. Says Tom, the law says that uh, business owners actually have to have to play a fiduciary role for their employees, which means that they have to choose a 401k and administer a 401k that is in the best interests of the employees. I bet so, many business owners don't even realize that. They, uh, sadly, they do not. When I mention the phrase, do you know that your fees must be both reasonable and prudent and the plan must be for the sole benefit of its employees? That language is fresh language that's never passed their ears. So pretty powerful language, but not if people don't actually know about it. And I imagine enforcement is probably uh, minimal. And as, as Josh suggested, 
we have no idea what will happen in the months and years to come in terms of enforcement, maybe a rollback, uh, something of that nature. The, the stunning part, if I spoke to 100 plan sponsors this week and I said, let's go forward and do a side-by-side -side comparison of your plan, let's first get a copy of your 408B2. At least 70 to 75% will say, what is that? I have never reviewed it. I'm not sure where to get it. Where do I get it? What does that document contain? And here we are in 2017, something that has been published since July of 2012 under the law of ERISA. They are to read it, articulate it, make changes if necessary. And most well-intentioned employers, again, so deeply into running their business, have no idea even that this document exists and the information it contains. And then we, when we extract the information that it contains, that's when shock and awe comes into play, where they almost can't believe the effects of time. Right. Well, so from, uh, from uh, the participant of the, the investor, the employee, uh, we've all been hearing a lot in the past few years about the benefits of ETFs, exchange traded funds, which are, are basically uh, very low cost, passively managed funds. That means that they don't have an investment manager who's buying in and out of the stock market every day. Um, should these folks, is for them, is it just as simple as using low-cost index funds in your in your company's plan and avoiding these expensive uh, actively managed funds? It, it's certainly it's certainly in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, some, many of the largest plans, the big companies like you know, I'm, I always say Apple probably doesn't have a four hundred one k problem, right? The, the biggest plans are, are typically. Um, have those type of low-cost funds. However, it goes back to what I talked about earlier. Low-cost funds don't offer commissions, and they're extremely inexpensive. And so that throws a little bit of a, of a, of a wrench in the plan. And when we talked about the, you know, the mutual funds getting you know, paying to be on the shelf, so if there's no if right. there's no ability for the index funds to have charge enough to be able to pay the provider, the providers are usually very reluctant. So typically what we see is, even though there's a, a certainly a popularity to a move towards low-cost index funds like Vanguard and others, what you see is in the vast majority of plans, 90% of the plans where they're small businesses, right? Doctors, dentists, lawyers, manufacturers, etc. They don't offer those type of index funds in the plan. They don't offer them. And then what they'll tell you typically is you don't qualify. And what that means is, you don't, we don't make enough money off your size of plan <laughs> in order to offer you low cost index funds. Okay. So that's, right. that's typically what, what you'll hear. Um, the second thing is, is that what we have started to see is they have started to acquiesce and say, yeah, we'll put low cost index funds in your plan, but they're not going to kill the, you know, goose that laid the golden egg that quickly. And so what you end up seeing is a couple, you know, what I call sleight of hand moves. Number one is you'll see markups. So I'll give you an example. There's a, we have, uh, we see typically where like a, an S&P 500 index fund might cost five, five basis points or 0.05%. Um, we see them often for one or one and a half, one, one as high as 1.68%. So that's a 3,600% wow. markup. So these guys are taking super low cost products, something for which there yes. might be a 0.05% fee and multiplying that fee by 20, 30 times. Easy in in those yes. cases. Yep, all the time, all the time. Right. Another That's group, remarkable. another group might charge a little less. Like maybe they'll charge instead of point zero five, they'll charge point six five. So they'll mark it up, you know, maybe only twelve or thirteen times, uh, twelve or thirteen hundred percent. But then they'll also charge a sales load. So they'll 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 take three percent on every dollar, on every dollar going in. Another one, um, you know, we have we have clients that come to us all the time and say, hey, you know, I think I'm in good shape. I've got a low cost. I got a low cost lineup of funds and we'll look at the funds and on first glance, they'll have really low expense ratios like, you know, 0 0.05, 0 you know, 0 0.10. And we go, wow, this looks really good. However, what they often do is they recategorize their revenue in something called, they typically call it like a contract asset charge or an asset management charge where they say, oh yeah, sure. You're going to have low cost index funds, but you know what? We're going to charge one and a half or two and a half percent on the entire plan balance regardless. So they'll just, mm -hmm. they're going to make it one way or the other. So low cost index funds, although in the general trajectory of the right decision, uh, it's got to be a little bit more, you got to look a little further, a couple, a couple layers uh, got to right. be peeled back. 
Well, going back again to the perspective of the business owner, you know, I, I follow this as the editor of Worth, which is a financial magazine. I see some news articles about business owners who are actually um, occasionally getting uh, because uh, uh, they are not actually um, following the letter of this new law and acting in the sole interest of their employees when they choose and administer a, a 401k plan. What, Tom, what, what do business owners need to be aware of and, and what can employees do if they're stuck in an expensive plan? From a business owner's perspective, it is important that on a regular basis that they do a benchmark, benchmark fancy work for comparison as an alternative to their existing providers. And the key is to do it in a non-biased basis. Because if you take it back to your provider and say, compare my plan against others, or back to Joe the broker who might be your brother-in-law or whomever, they're going to find a biased way to do that benchmark. But if you go out to a third party, and in this case, we'd actually would be a third party because we're just going to provide numbers to numbers, is that you want to have real clarity on where your plan stands as opposed to what it could be. Again, this goes back to the fact, as a plan sponsor, you are the fiduciary of the plan, and you have a legal obligation to ensure the plan is for the sole benefit of its participants. And this is pretty easy to do. You know, in 2014, it was the Department of Labor added close to 1,100 more examiners. And these examiners are knocking on the doors of businesses across America and doing plan examinations. And there's really six things where a plan could be considered or deemed to be out of compliance with excessive fees that were have not been addressed being one of those. This was back in 2014 that the DOL determined that 75% of the plans it examined were illegal. And the average fine to the business owner, this is a personal liability now, was $600,000. And we've seen cases where the plan assets were not relative to the plan fine itself. So that's one path that the employer has to be concerned about. The other thing we have to be concerned about is participant litigation. It's all over the news now. The amount of providers being sued, in many cases, the 401k participants of 401k providers themselves suing their own employer. So think about it. There's been some big insurance companies in the 401k business whose own participants have soon, so sued their own employer for the use of proprietary funds that have excessive fees. So it's another case, like we say, of a cook, you know, willing to sell you his food but not eat it himself. So participants are in a bit of a, not tenuous spot, but a sensitive spot. Look, they're employed by someone, right? Everybody wants to keep and maintain their job and hopefully grow to it. But a lot of times participants will come to our website, run a fee checker, We'll then provide further information to them and they'll like, wow, it looks like we really have a bad plan and could be improved. But there's a general hey, uh, but, sorry, they're, they're, but they're reticent to go to their employer for feel of for fear of any sort of about pushback, right? On why are you bringing this to me? And yet it's their money and they feel they have a right. The key reason we try to stress to employees why they should push it up to their employer is the employer has generally the largest balance in the plan and therefore the most to lose. So this is something that's good for everybody. That's right. That was actually where I was, I was going to go, is that this doesn't necessarily have to be an adversarial conversation or process because, as you point out, Tom, the, the business owner often is going to be the biggest investor in that 401k and probably um, oftentimes the best paid person in the company. Uh, and so the business owner not only has a kind of legal self-interest in making sure that that their plan uh, that he or she is acting as a fiduciary, they also have a financial self-interest in it. Well, I spoke to an attorney on Tuesday that we met at one of Tony's events last week in Florida. It was a plan with $1.4 million in assets. And to Josh's point earlier, he went out for a day and a half to try to get his fee disclosure. And he sent me all the emails that were going back and forth between his providers saying, Jim, we'll just call him, you know, attorney Jim has been asking for his fee disclosure. What do we say? How do we get it to him? What should we do? You can see all this. He wrote me an email. He's like, Tom, look at all these emails below. Do they not want me to see this thing? Are they doing something misleading here? Why, this is my information. Why can't I get to it? And when he finally got it, and I knew the data we were going to see because I knew the provider and the size of the plan, he told me that very thing. He said, of the 1.4 million, 
850,000 belongs to my wife and I. We're the ones getting really beat up here. Right. So the changes they make for themselves now have an intrinsic and residual effect for their employees as well, and they get to be a hero across the board. Tom, I want to come back to something that you touched upon briefly, podcast, um, which is that I, I understand that America's Best 401k, a company that Josh also works with as chief marketing officer, um, you guys have, have taken it upon yourselves to provide any business with a complimentary cost comparison, sort of a look under the hood. What does that process look like, and, and what can businesses expect if they hear this podcast, if they're listening to this, and they decide to go to America's Best 401k and take advantage of that offer? It's really simple to do, is we need really two pieces of information. The fee disclosure that I mentioned earlier, and we really like to get a copy of the employer version, the 408b2, because it should have all the data contained or referred to that I can then help them dig a little bit further. That, along with any notation of any invoice fees that they might receive. So what we do is we put this into a very easy-to-read three-page document that takes into account their existing plan assets, estimated annual contributions, a growth rate, factor in all the expenses, and then we run that out month after month, year after year, out 20 years, and we show the, measurable, the measurables in five-year increments. So you can start to see and get a glimpse into the future of if you stayed with this plan, as opposed to America's Best 401k, which is going to have all-in investment expenses generally around 0.65%, and the plans we're reviewing on average are 1.5% to 2.5%, you're going to have a visual number that shows that over this period of time, 20 years, that you are going to lose this dollar amount in savings, and that if you work with us over that time, that same dollar amount then correlates that goes back into your pocket. Now you have a visual to work with. Now you have a real number to latch onto that shows you we're just two millimeters of change, just pivoting away from where you are, fundamentally and radically changes the outcome of the business owner, the employees, and their families as well after they stop working. And that's a substantial, John, that's a substantial number. I, let's go back to Joe, the attorney, and the $1.4 million he's got in the plan over 20 years uh, the difference, the incremental difference, all things being equal, just say the same growth rate, the same contributions, if he stuck with his existing plan versus uh, switching to America's Best, America's Best put an additional uh, over $1 million back into the plan that goes right back to he, he and his employees. Um, and, and that's even being nice because we say all things being equal and our plan only uses low-cost index funds. We don't have any brokers. There's no commissions. So his plan is stacked with actively managed mutual funds where there's a broker involved. And so I'm just being nice on the all things being equal. But um, it's a really it's a it's a substantial impact for a small business owner who you think spends day in, day out working so hard to succeed in their business, to be able to put money away and to let that money just walk out the back door is an unacceptable outcome uh, that we are. That's why we say we, we are in the business of rescuing the retirement plans of Americans. Tom, let me ask you one final question, if I may. Um, I, and it goes back again to that issue of inertia. So mm -hmm. I imagine that, that business owners, uh, they simply think that uh, um, even if they realize that they're overpaying for their plan or the plan's products, um, they assume that it's a complicated and painstaking and time-consuming procedure to change 401k providers. And you, you know what? They're too busy running their business. It's a competitive world out there. There's always something that's more pressing. Is it actually that hard to, to change? Actually, it's not that hard to change. It's, in fact, easy to change when you have experts involved. So in our model, we assign a conversion specialist on our end, one person, who works with that plan sponsor or their representative to take that plan through its conversion cycle over a six to 10 week period of time. And when I say six to 10, it's usually in about six weeks, we're ready to start accepting deferrals on our end. Industry average will show that it takes about 10 weeks for the prior provider to finally send over the assets to the new plan. So we assume all the heavy lifting. At the outset, in fact, we have a new onboarding form where in less than seven minutes, 
Somebody can get started with us. The summary information we need to get moving. Our team then reaches out to collect the existing plan documents, supporting information, summary plan description, and the census. And then everything shifts to us. So we emphasize to the business owner, keep your eye on the ball on your business. We'll manage this entire process. We connect with the existing providers, the former ones, to facilitate the transfer of the assets. We keep your employees abreast of the change. We then launch a webinar or a conference call blend for the new employees to introduce the new website. Then our advisory team steps in to give personal advice for individual direction in creating your portfolio. So the whole circle around that is you worry about maintaining your business. We will manage the 401k plan. Serving as the 338 fiduciary, which is our role, we are taking on as much fiduciary liability and responsibility that the law permits. So those list of things we talked about earlier in the podcast shifts over to us. There's no conversion fee to move over. The biggest hindrance generally is the existing relationships. Right? It's a matter of unhinging those. It might be a brother-in-law or Joe the broker you met at Rotary or some other event that the biggest difficulty we will see to people making that change is that a sort of a fear, I would call it, of going to their existing provider and saying, we have to move on. Because we provide oftentimes empirical evidence to do so, and they can see that a rapid and near-term change makes sense for everybody involved. So the bottom line is it's very, very easy. Great. Listen, uh, Tom Zagainer and Josh Robbins from America's Best 401k, I want to thank you for, for spending the time to talk about this issue. It is both individually and on a national level, it is a hugely important issue because, as you guys both know, and as lots of folks who are listening to this know, most Americans don't get pensions anymore. Most Americans depend on their IRAs or their 401ks for the money that they're going to live off during retirement. And what you've been talking about is how much money they are losing um, that is could have a profound impact on their ability to retire and their quality of life during retirement. Uh, and I just think it, it's something that most folks don't think about enough. Uh, and I hope that they uh, the, uh, learn some things during this podcast. And if, if they want to learn more, I would recommend that, that folks go visit America's for, best 401 kcom that's America's best 401k.com. Uh, Tom Zagainer and Josh Robbins, thank you both so much. This is uh, Richard Bradley from Worth Magazine. Uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Hey, it's Tony Robbins. Listen, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Unshakable podcast. It's the companion to my new book, Unshakable Your Financial Freedom Playbook Creating a Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. And it's co-authored with my dear partner, Peter Malouk. Listen, by listening to this series, along with reading the book, you'll be armed with all the essential facts and strategies you need to help transform your financial life. So if any of the ideas here you've heard today have struck a chord with you, and you're interested in getting a second opinion on your own financial plan, or create one if you don't have one, then please go to getasecondopinion.com. That's getasecondopinion.com to have a creative planning advisor take a look at your portfolio, or again, help you to create a plan it's completely complimentary, completely free, and there's no commitment necessary. I'd also personally love it if you'd leave a review of this podcast on iTunes. I'd love to know what you thought of the program. And also, I'd love to hear any new questions you have, any takeaways you took from the podcast. And if you want to share any success stories about your own journey towards financial freedom, we'd certainly love to hear about it. For more information about my book and some more related articles, videos, and other information that can help you to create that unshakable state and achieve the financial freedom you want, Go to unshakable.com and know that 100% of this book's profits are being donated Feeding America. 45 million people in this country every night don't know where their next meal is going to come from. 17 million are children. And your contribution to this book, 100% of those profits are going to feed them. We'll feed 50 million people this book and we'll feed another 50 million, 100 million next year alone just with the additional bonuses that I'm offering, the additional benefits I'm getting Feeding America as well. So thanks for being my partner. And live strong, live with passion, and we'll hear you and meet you on the next podcast. The Unshakable podcast was produced in collaboration with wealth management firm Creative Planning. It is hosted by Richard Bradley, editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine, and features business and life strategist Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk of Creative Planning, with special guest Tom Zagainer. This podcast is produced and distributed by Robbins Research International. Copyright 2017.
What does it really mean to be unshakable? It's not just a matter of money, it's a state of mind. When you're truly unshakable, you have an unwavering confidence amidst the storm. It's not that nothing upsets you, we all get hooked at times, but you just don't stay there. Nothing rattles you for any length of time. This state of mind allows you to be a leader, not a follower, to be the chess player, not the chess piece, to be one of the few who do, not the many who talk. Hi, this is Richard Bradley. I'm the editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine, and I'm here with Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk. We are talking about their new book, Unshakable, Your Financial Freedom Playbook, Creating Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. Tony and Peter, I wanted to talk about the fact that there's been a continuous battle in the financial services industry between the quote-unquote fiduciary advisors, those who believe you should have to put your client's best interest first, and the brokerage community, those who believe that so long as a product is generally suitable for a client, there's no need for a fiduciary legal standard. So both of you have been proponents of the fiduciary standard, but as I read this chapter, I realized that even the the, uh, fiduciaries have figured out a way to operate in legal gray areas. So this is one episode where I think the listener is going to get an incredible value because they need to know exactly what their own financial advisor is, regardless of whether or not they like him or her personally. Talk a little bit about, why don't we start with Peter here, because I know you've done a lot of work on this and you write about it in Unshakable. What are the different categories of quote unquote financial advisors and what does it really mean for clients? Can I interject something first? Because I think it's important for people to know that the community as a whole, right? The people that you look to for financial advice You have to start with a presupposition, and that is, do I want somebody that's legally required to put my interests first, or do I want to hope that somebody that I like, who might even be sincere, but they could be sincerely wrong because they're representing a firm who is not putting your interests first, and they're not legally required to. That's the difference between a broker with a suitability standard, which is anything that's suitable, versus a fiduciary standard, as we said before, they tell you to buy IBM, you buy it, they buy it later in the day, they legally got to give you the the better stock that they bought later on. That's a very different standard. And people have to understand that because of the 310,000 people that are in this financial advising community around the United States, you're talking 90% of them are brokers. They might be called a wealth manager, a wealth advisor, anything of that nature. So really you have to understand only 10% of them are legally required to put you first, to make your interests the number one focus. To me, that seems insane. But even amongst them, there's a differentiation. So let me clarify, and then I'll throw it to Peter, and he'll give you some of the details. There's only three types of advisors. Brokers, that's 90% of that 310,000, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's a group of people called fiduciaries, or independent registered investment advisors, RIAs. They are held to that higher standard. So of the 310,000, there's 31,000. I wrote about that in Money Master the Game. Part of why we became partners is because Peter came along and educated me that what he calls where the dead bodies are. There's this gray area that people are able to go to that even the fiduciaries are able to go to where they're what's called duly registered. It means they're registered as a broker and as a registered investment advisor or fiduciary. So this is the crazy thing. (laughs) They're sitting in front of you wearing a hat that says, I'm an RIA, I'm one of the few who do, that put you first, I'm legally required, I'm not making commissions off of you, I have no conflicts of interest, I'm only giving advice because I really believe it's the best for you, not because I'm getting paid commissions to do that. In the middle of the conversation, they can turn their hat sideways and become a broker. You don't even know they changed hats. They don't have to tell you that. They, they don't have to do tell it. you that because they're just duly registered. And now what they're doing is they're selling you a product that they make a larger commission on. They're selling you a product that isn't necessarily better for you. It's suitable for you. And they're playing the exact same game. When I found this, I went totally berserk. Now, I understand a lot of these RAAs were brokers who wanted to wear the white hat, who wanted to leave an industry that's closed and controlled where the house always wins, where the house designs what they're gonna offer you, and they took this risk. And quite frankly, it's hard to make money when you're just getting a flat fee or a small percentage of the assets. And so they try to figure a way to play both places and still try to have integrity. So I'm not attacking them. But morally, you're either for me 100% or not. Switching hats in the middle to me is insane. Maybe you can relate to share with some of the, some of the things they got to look out for because yeah, this is right. just crazy. It's crazy. This is an extremely complex space, so it's no wonder the average person's confused. First of all, I'd say it's a shame that it happens in the United States because if you look at other countries, the United Kingdom, Australia, 
Every advisor has to be a fiduciary. It's the law. It's, it's the law. It's reasonable to assume if you go to the financial advisor, they have to put your best interest first. And we get to the United States and you go, well, the United States just lets everybody do whatever they want. Not true. We say doctors have to act in their patients' best interests. Lawyers have a fiduciary obligation. CPAs do. This is unique to financial advisors in the United States. So why? Because the financial uh, lobby, the brokerage houses, formed a lobby that is very active in keeping the fiduciary standard from prevailing. Why? Because they want to sell their own products. They want to charge more for certain things than other things. They don't want to have to in the client's best interest. They want to continue to act in the shareholder's best interest, which means you want to extract as much from the client as possible, which you can't be aligned and be doing that. You can make a reasonable profit, but you can't have the fiduciary standard and be as profitable as you are today. So this is why 90% of people are brokers. And like Tony says, most of these are really good people. They're trying to get a job and brokerage houses will hire you and say, go produce in our model. And then they're successful and it's hard to leave. Now, like Tony said, 10% say, you know what? I'm going to be a fiduciary. I'm going to hold myself to the highest standard under the law. I'm, I don't have to in the United States, but I'm going to opt to be a fiduciary. I'm going to be a registered investment advisor or work for one, which means every client I'm with, with I have to act in their best interests. So somebody comes along and goes, you know what? I'm going to do both. Well, guess what? You can do that in the United States. You can be. Now, when you ask them, what are you? Are you a fiduciary? Or, you know, they will always in their pitch meetings say, I'm a fiduciary. You know, I'm, and they're telling the truth. They are a fiduciary. Mm -hmm. But I have never heard a client tell me, yeah, my former advisor said they're a fiduciary and a broker. And, That's just never and happened. there's no legal requirement for them to tell you that. No, you can go online if you are f familiar with FINRA's website, the SEC's website, and figure it all out yourself. But I mean, Tony talked to the 50 of the top financial people in the history of the world and <laughs> didn't know that, you know, after yeah. he came out of his book. And I will tell you, the people I'm in front of that have 100,000 or 100 million, nobody knows this. This is a complicated mess. And it's become further complicated because now brokers have to be fiduciaries in certain instances. And independent advisors, we know some of them are duly registered and they're not fiduciaries. So you, you have to get down to a, a, a very small group that's a fiduciary when it comes to investments all the time. So you basically want to say, are you a registered investment advisor? And um, are you also affiliated with a broker dealer? Uh, you want them to be a registered investment advisor who is not affiliated with a broker dealer. Mm -hmm. From there, it even gets messier. You can still have a fiduciary that has their own products. So I can set up my own RIA, and then I can have, create my own mutual funds, hedge funds if I want. I can say I'm a fiduciary, I can charge you a fee, and then I go put my funds into your portfolio. And charge you another couple percent. Charge you another, right. is, which is like going to the Honda dealership and, and paying a fee to ask what car you should buy. Don't be surprised when you get the Honda. Right? So, uh, so I'm, I'm going to be honest. Right now, I'm, I'm feeling a little confused, a little demoralized, yeah, right. a little overwhelmed. Yeah. What's the answer? What's the, what, what are the right questions to ask that will kind of uh, not take you down the road of all the possibilities, but tell you what the right solutions are? Well, for, first of all, just remember, there's only three things. So are they a broker? Are they duly registered or are they completely independent? That's what you gotta look for. But maybe you can give them some of the criteria, the well, things to ask for. At first I say don't be demoralized. I think one of my favorite things Tony says in all contexts, that's just when it comes to this, is don't do the same thing and expect a different outcome, right? You have the financial advisor you deserve. There are plenty of financial advisors out there that are pure fiduciaries, not just creative planning. Yes, we want Everybody in America to be a client of credit, but we know that's not the, the there's, reality. There's, there's plenty of great there, firms. To be specifically, yeah. there's 5,000 yeah. out of 310,000. Now you know why it's so hard to get there. So it is hard, but there's 5,000 of them in the United States out of the 310,000 that are not duly registered yeah. and that are truly registered investment advisors who are fiduciary only for your benefit. So and, That's right. And everybody listening to this podcast, just spending this 10 or 15 minutes with us, already knows that all they have to do is ask their financial advisor, are you a registered investment advisor? We want the answer to be yes. Mm -hmm. Are you affiliated with a, a broker? You want, you want the answer to be no. You could also ask, do you have the Series 7? You want the answer to that to be no. That's the license for being a broker. And then do you, own any, do you have any proprietary funds or does a sister company affiliated with you have any of your own funds? You want the answer to be no. Which, by the way, just yeah. to clarify, I, I won't say the firm, but there's a particular firm, and I like the people involved very much, the strong fiduciaries, and they lay out the plan for you for you know, your 1% or less, but then they recommend these funds, and these funds are owned by another firm, owned by the same person, right? So, and they don't tell you that. 
It's just like when I found it out, it's just you want to strangle me, you're going to charge me 2%. I already paid you to tell me what's the best investment. Why would I pay you on top of it and then 2% when it's your fund? That's, that's like it's double dipping once again. And they'll even nuts. have a different name. So there's a no different way name. you can connect yeah. the yeah, two. Without a doubt. Yeah. And so, I, I, again, the, the folks, they can look, they can easily evaluate their advisor. And like that's the first step. We still want them to have a good investment philosophy yeah. to be used to working with people like you to manage enough money to have some scale and so on. But the bottom line is if you respect everything you've ever earned, right, and you want to do best by your family, you should be asking these questions. Does this person at least have to act in my best interest? And a lot of people, they get to that point, they're ready to make a move, and they say, well, but that person's, you know, I'm clo that person's a, a friend, or I used to work with them, or the son or parent of a friend or whatever. And I, I express, ex express to your listeners now what I express to them, which is your first loyalty should be to your family. Right, so if you know that you are better served, and of course everyone's better served when someone has to act in their best interests, uh, do you want your spouse, who might not be as sophisticated as you are, as involved as you are, walking into their office when you're gone, and then, you know, winding up with whatever product that maybe you have a guard or awareness about that they don't? So if you've put the family first instead of that relationship, it becomes very easy to follow through on that decision after you get educated. That's right. It makes the choice starker, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. You also just got to think about the fact that that a lot of these firms will hide that they're making commissions by they change the name they they call it consulting fees. Mm -hmm. Can you you were the first person to tell me right. about this? So there are some independent firms because you're not allowed. You know, if you don't have a license, if you're purely independent, uh, like Creative Planning, we don't. No one has the Series Seven. We couldn't collect a commission from a mutual fund company if we wanted to, but we could. Believe it or not, we could go to a mutual fund company and go, "Hey, we'd like some consulting fees." And so instead of revenue sharing for the mutual fund, they give us consulting fees. Now, I don't know what consulting we're doing, right? So you can collect those fees, and it's the same quid quo. It's just a crazy deal. Unfortunately, I mean, this become, this, that, that layer is very, very difficult to get to. At some point, you just need to feel like, you know, once I've checked all those other boxes, that hopefully my advisor is not engaging in those kinds of practices. Another common industry practice is an independent firm can charge somebody 1% and say, hey, we're now going to go to a portfolio manager that charges just 0.25 or just 0.3, but they are that portfolio manager. It's just a different name, right? So I'm charging you 1% and then I send you down the hall and then that guy might go buy it funds owned by other companies, but we've layered another fee in there. The advisor should just get one fee on your investments. It should be disclosed up front and it should it should not change based on any way, shape or form that I present the investment rights. And you got to remember once again, I got to say it again, you know, you got to pay something for this, right? That's it's one percent right. or less is what you should be paying for everything, and if you're paying that two percent or that three percent, every one percent above that is costing you ten years of retirement income because of not only does your you get compounding on your investments, but fees compound. That's what people are missing. And so you hear one percent, you think nothing, or two percent, you think nothing. It could be the difference between financial freedom or financial insecurity. It really can be. So, Peter and Tony, let's say that someone is either on their own uh, or because they've been listening to these podcasts and thinking about their own financial situation. Let's say they're, they're considering making a move to another advisor, let's say. For your guys' benefit, it's going to be a creative planning, which I know you both work at and, and uh, can benefit from. Sure, of course. Um, I talk with a lot of folks uh, who think that they want to make that move but are intimidated by the fact they imagine it's logistically just a paperwork nightmare that it's going to take months and months. Is that true? Or you is it, you should well, it's remarkably easy, a little bit easier. Years ago when, when Tony moved over to the independent, independent world himself and started the self-discovery, you know, you just bring your most recent statement in, you sign some paperwork, and a week or two later, everything shows up as is. There's also this perception that everything gets sold. You know, I've, I've just had somebody in my office yesterday said, okay, I made the decision to come over, but I hate all the taxes I'm going to pay. I said, wait, so you're not going to pay any taxes because the funds move over as is. So if you bought Microsoft at $5 and it's 10 times higher today, we'll hold that position. And by the way, you'd like an advisor to continue to hold it. You don't want somebody who's going to blow it out and go do, go do something in their specific strategy. You want it customized and tailored to your needs. You don't want to create a lot of damage to hire an advisor. So it's a matter of paperwork. You wait a few weeks, everything shows up as is. If you've got a good advisor, they'll come back to you and say, hey, look, some of these things we're going to hold for tax reasons or because they're perfectly good. And then we'll make these changes over here. And you can put yourself in a better spot you know, very quickly. You know, there's another question that comes up a lot when, when folks are meeting with potential financial planners. Uh, you hear it, I think, pretty often. What's your philosophy when it comes to investing? You guys think this is a question that, that potential clients should ask? Is that right? 
everybody is an individual, right? So the beauty of CPI or any great firm of this nature is, I, I was talking to Mary Calhoun Erdos, who's head of JP Morgan. She manages, between her team, she manages 2.3 trillion with a T, right? And one of the great things she said to me is, she, and this is part of what I do as you know, investor psychology, she said, you've got to understand what that individual needs because money isn't just money, it's emotion. And so we got to get you where you need to be financially, but we got to do it in a way that psychologically doesn't produce so much stress that you're not going to fall through or you're going to jump out the first place. So everything has to be done for an individual. These cookie cutter things that people do where they have three funds and the, the Aspen and the, and the turkey and the whatever fund <laughs> that they have, right? And they put everybody into it. One size fits all to me is a, and then charging one, two, three percent of that. It's, it's absurd. It's a disservice at the highest level. Uh, Peter's firm sits down with a couple and they walk through the process. You leave with a binder like this with simple tabs. You know who's in charge for you. And once you've laid it together, I mean, how often do you really meet with your, it depends on the individual, right? It depends right? on but, what they're, they set the schedule, but a lot of it's very easy to maintain from there on. Yeah. Sometimes it's once or twice or three times in a year you might be visiting with somebody, but you've laid together a plan that really makes sense and it's individualized for you. And I, th I think that's really an important point and it comes back to something we talked about in previous podcasts, which is really what are you aiming for? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's about maximizing the, the growth of your money, but it's also, as you both talk about in the book, it's about what you want out of life. Yeah. It's about leading a healthy, happy, meaningful life and uh, letting your money grow to the point where you can do that. And for everyone, that's going to be different. And I'm so glad you said that because most people, when they're shopping, they don't realize that's what they're looking for. And that really is ultimately what everyone's looking for. When you ask them, well, what do you want the money? Well, I need this much money per year for 10 years in retirement because I'm going to travel a lot. Then I want to spend less. You want the portfolio pointing to that. You can go to an advisor and find out they're an RIA, they're a fiduciary, they're not duly registered, they fit all of those things, but they're a market timer. Or all yeah. they're focused on is maximum growth. Well, maximum growth, if it can go up 20% in a year, it can go down 20%. That's in a year. That's a rule of investing. And so you really want somebody who's going to say, what are we trying to do for you? For some people, it is maximum growth. They're financially independent and they're giving you, you know, I've got people that have tens of millions of dollars who go, my goal is to double this in a certain period of years. Okay, that's our mission. That's not most people. Most people, I need this much money at this period of my life. And I know I'm going to get some of it from other sources, but I need to get this much from here. Well, how do we make that portfolio have the highest probability of creating that specific outcome? That should be the mission of your advice. With the least amount of risk. Yeah. Right? So you're not going through the volatility. I mean, that's really what this is about. Getting people unshakable is getting them into a place where they have a plan and an advisor that can navigate whatever comes. Where they're prepared, they know that there are going to be corrections. There's going to be bear markets. But we're going to make sure that you maximize lowest, lowest downside possible, most upside possible, but also do it without paying an arm and a leg and giving away a third or 50% or in some cases 70% of your nest egg to somebody that just is frankly just overcharged you. So this is a great conversation for a client to have, an investor to have with a financial planner because it's not just about how much money do you want. It's really about what do you want to do with your life? What are you investing for? And I think, frankly, those are things that, that we're all so busy, we just don't think about enough. Yeah. And I think that's where sitting down with somebody who's qualified knows how to dig in and help you uncover what are your needs really today, tomorrow, in the future? What's going to fulfill you? It's not just like the necessity so I can retire. I mean, most people today, a lot of people don't want to retire. Some of the most successful people in the world that are my clients, they're never going to retire. I'm never going to retire. You know, you look at Warren Buffett's, what, 85 years old right now. Steve Wynn's a dear friend of mine. He's 74. Peter Gober owns the Golden State Warriors, 74 years old. And they're doing more today than any other time. The goal is to have enough money that you don't have to work. And then ironically, you usually work at something you love, even if it's nonprofit. You yep. do it because it fulfills you, not because you have to. And you walk different, but you'll never get there if you don't know who to trust. You'll never get there if you don't know the hidden fees and the, the half-truths, if you will, that are part of this industry. So you got to get yourself a fiduciary, somebody that is not selling their own funds or somebody else's and getting a compensation or consulting, somebody who truly puts your needs ahead of everybody else's. But I have to add one more piece. Um, there's a cross that you can think of. 
if this is a salesman and we're going across to a fiduciary, a lawyer, a doctor, a true financial fiduciary who has to put your needs ahead, you want to not be on this end, on this end. And if we've got an arrow going up and down and down here is, you know, somebody that's unsophisticated and up here is somebody who's totally sophisticated, you want to get an RAA who isn't just an RAA and not just somebody who isn't duly registered. You want to get somebody that's sophisticated, that knows what to do, that's been through the bear market successfully. Somebody also, quite frankly, is large enough to be able to have been through the ups and downs and managed it effectively. And so that highly sophisticated total fiduciary, that's your target. And in the book, we give you a series of checklists of exactly what to ask for everybody. So you don't have to try and memorize this and you'll be able to uncover it. Cause yeah. I've had guys look at me straight in the face. Like I actually personally knew and asked him, he's a fiduciary, look at me straight in the face, he's a fiduciary. And then I said to him, do you get commissions? And he says, no, no commissions. I was like, okay, I think, I, but he was getting consulting fees. <laughs> and, like, and who would know to ask that question? Yeah, I didn't know to ask that question. Yeah, right. that's, that's Peter's yeah. gift in helping me in this book as our partnership. And we've done everything we can to educate. And so, you know, it's up to the listener or the reader of the book to just de demand, demand it. And there's, thou like Tony said, there's thousands of options, but they're, cl they're hidden among hundreds of thousands of options. But you can find those people with, with, with this information and make it's, a good decision. It's literally 5,000 out of 310,000. So that's 1.6% of a marketplace, right. which tells you 98% you want to avoid, right. but there's that 1.5% roughly that, that you want to do and business And that 1.5%, I, I don't know if it's 90% or less, are overseeing 30 million or less. It's a very scattered. So you really get to a very small group of firms with any scale in that space. So and, we, and here you have 22 billion to give you an idea of growing. At Creative Planning. Yeah. So we've talked about a number of questions that, that investors ought to ask a financial planner. There's one more I think that is important, but it, it sounds technical, but it, it, it's still a, a great question to ask. And that is, where will my money be held? Uh, great question. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important? Well, yeah, it's interesting. Bernie Madoff is why that's that, important. That's a big one. I mean, we're, we're actually here in West Palm, and, and from here I go to Fort Lauderdale to meet somebody who lost $13 million in the Madoff oh. uh, scandal. He had $13 million there. And people often ask me, well, how did that happen? How would I uncover? And I said, look, this is easy. You don't have to uncover anything. Don't ever give an advisor your money. It's that simple. So people go, but babe, I, don't you want to manage my money? I say, I do, but we don't take custody of the money, and most advisors don't. So when somebody hires creative planning or most independent advisors, you don't ever write a check to creative planning. You write it to a custodian. Custodians that people would have heard of would be like TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, Fidelity, Scott Trade. So the money's never coming to creative planning or the advisor. It's going to the custodian. So we would help a client fill out paperwork, moving it from wherever they are. Let's say it's Merrill Lynch or another brokerage house over to that custodian. They have their own online access. They have their own independent statements. They don't have to take our word for it on anything. We don't have ac access to take their money and run off to the Bahamas. It's their money. We just have the authority to place the trades. And so that's the best setup. Now, I think Madoff, Madoff was an independent advisor, but he took custody. Yeah. So that's yeah. the issue is don't ever let an advisor take it. Some people go, but this person's uh, in my church or religious affiliation, or I know them from the, the shared uh, living place. Well, actually, the majority of Ponzi schemes, like Bernie Madoff, are what are called affinity scams, which they're people preying on their own. So to me, that's so that's not a great, exactly the wrong. That's argument. exactly the wrong argument uh, to be making. And some people say, "But oh, that's such a good money manager. You don't need a money manager so badly to give somebody custody of your money." Let's mm -hmm. eliminate that risk. I mean, we've right. touched on in this podcast all three of the C's that, that people are looking for, whether they know it or not. One is no one wants them to steal their money. That's custody. That's that C, right? Don't let anybody have custody of your money. It's that easy. Second, conflict. Well, don't accept it. You don't have to work with an advisor that has a conflict. Don't work with somebody who's a broker or affiliated uh, with a brokerage house who's duly registered or sells their own products. And third is competence. You know, that scale, that chart Tony was, was talking about. Look for a firm that's a little more sophisticated, somebody who's got experience. You don't go get knee surgery from somebody who does one knee surgery a month. You want the guy who's doing it three times a day, every day, right, that knows what he's doing. And so I think if you focus on those three C's, you're, you're in much better shape. So and, and, and advertising doesn't do that. In the world we're in today, people want content so bad that you can work on Bloomberg and have somebody up there give you advice. I saw some things when Money Master Game came out, and one particular man, and I did more than 100 interviews, but one particular man and a buddy of his who are independent advisors, I couldn't believe it. They were attacking Ray Dalio and saying he doesn't know what he's talking about in this book. You know, he's the most successful hedge fund guy in the history of the world. We should all not 26 know what we're right? talking about like that. Uh, but but it's sitting there and Bloomberg and this guy's talking about things. And I find out one of the guys managing a hundred million dollars, like you know your savings account for everybody. That's the total amount he's managing. Another guy was managing. Uh, Josh was telling me I think it was ten million dollars total. So. 
You do need to make sure it's still somebody that has got the skill set. That's why referral can be so valuable as well. So let's say uh, you're happy with your advisor or you've, you've gotten a new one. There's another part of the process that also seems really important, but it's kind of overlooked. And that's what to look out for when you're looking at your statements, right? Whether they're month, once a month or whether you're looking online. Um, Peter and Tony, can you talk about the things that, that will really be helpful um, to really get the most out of that statement? Well, I mean, one thing is, is kind of hard to figure out is what you really don't want to see on your statement is the, comp the advisor's own funds. And most brokerage houses and even independent advisors, as Tony talked about, they have their own funds, but they have different names. Mm -hmm. And so most statements, you can take that fund name, you can type it into Google, get a ticker symbol, and then you can start to learn about the fees, which we talked about in, in a recent podcast with you. And you can also start to learn who the parent company is. But I would tell you that you, if you're getting to that point, you're doing too much investigating. I think it's always a good place to, to, to go. But the ideal thing is just to find out, does your, does your firm you're working with have any access to proprietary funds? Because what you don't want is the existence of conflict. It doesn't mean if it's manifested itself now. When it's manifested itself, it's too late. I don't want to go to a doctor who gets paid more if I have a certain type of surgery uh, or a certain medicine in his cabinet that, that he owns. And if you buy that medicine, he's going to make more money. I want one that has all of them in his cabinet. So it doesn't really matter to me what I'm taking today. I don't want that conflict existing in our relationship. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I've been talking with Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk, the authors of the new book, Unshakable, your financial freedom playbook, creating peace of mind in a world of volatility. Um, this is one in a series of podcasts where we'll be doing some more. Thank you very much for, for talking today. Great to be with you again. Thank you. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Hey, it's Tony Robbins. Listen, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Unshakable podcast. It's the companion to my new book, Unshakable, your financial freedom playbook, creating a peace of mind in a world of volatility. And it's co-authored with my dear partner, Peter Malouk. Listen, by listening to this series, along with reading the book, you'll be armed with all the essential facts and strategies you need to help transform your financial life. So if any of the ideas here you've heard today have struck a chord with you, and you're interested in getting a second opinion on your own financial plan, or create one if you don't have one, then please go to getasecondopinion.com. That's getasecondopinion.com to have a creative planning advisor take a look at your portfolio, or again, help you to create a plan. It's completely complimentary completely free, and there's no commitment necessary. I'd also personally love it if you'd leave a review of this podcast on iTunes. I'd love to know what you thought of the program. And also, I'd love to hear any new questions you have, any takeaways you took from the podcast. And if you want to share any success stories about your own journey towards financial freedom, we certainly love to hear about it. For more information about my book and some more related articles, videos, and other information that can help you to create that unshakable state and achieve the financial freedom you want, go to unshakable.com. And know that 100% of this book's profits are being donated to Feeding America. 45 million people in this country every night don't know where their next meal is going to come from. 17 million are children. And your contribution to this book, 100% of those profits are going to feed them. We'll feed 50 million people with this book, and we'll feed another 50 million, 100 million next year alone, just with the additional bonuses that I'm offering, the additional benefits I'm getting Feeding America as well. So thanks for being my partner. And live strong, live with passion, and we'll hear you and meet you on the next podcast. The Unshakable Podcast was produced in collaboration with wealth management firm Creative Planning. It is hosted by Richard Bradley, editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine, and features business and life strategist Tony Robbins and Peter Malouk of Creative Planning. This podcast is produced and distributed by Robbins Research International, copyright 2017. What does it really mean to be unshakable? It's not just a matter of money, it's a state of mind. When you're truly unshakable, you have an unwavering confidence amidst the storm. It's not that nothing upsets you, we all get hooked at times, but you just don't stay there. Nothing rattles you for any length of time. This state of mind allows you to be a leader, not a follower, to be the chess player, not the chess piece, to be one of the few who do, not the many who talk. Welcome. I'm Richard Bradley, the editor-in-chief of Worth Magazine, and I'm here with Tony Robbins. He's the co-author of a new book called Unshakable, Your Financial Freedom Playbook, Creating Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. Uh, Tony, thank you. And I, I want to get right into the book. 
You talk in most of this book about the secrets to building wealth and how to achieve financial freedom, and it's incredibly effective and, and very powerful. But at the end, you take some time to talk about the meaning of something that you call true wealth. Yes. And I'm sitting there, I'm reading along and all about building financial wealth, and then all of a sudden you throw me this curveball. It's, yeah. wait, financial wealth versus true wealth. What does true wealth mean to you? Well, I, first of all, I would have felt remiss if I wrote an entire book on building wealth and I didn't talk about psychological, emotional, spiritual wealth because, you know, what do we want when we say we want money? You want little pieces of paper with pictures of deceased notables? I don't think so, right? You know, you want what you think money's going to give you, freedom or security or, you know, opportunities for your family or the ability to contribute to other people. I mean, money can be portable power. Money can be a lot of things, but it's, it's, it's whatever we make it up. I mean, it's almost like a shapeshifter. Whatever you throw on money, it's what it becomes. I always tell people money just makes you, it doesn't change people. It makes you more of what you are. If you're mean and you got a lot of money, you got more to be mean with. If you're truly generous and that's your nature and you have more money, you'll be more generous. I mean, it just, there's more resources that are coming through you. But to me, you know, really what we're talking about in real wealth is what is it that makes you feel truly abundant? What makes you feel totally alive? You know, what's, what's life on your terms look like? Because everyone's different. You know, some people's idea of wealth is a beautiful home with a white picket fence and three beautiful children. Some people's idea of extraordinary life is writing beautiful poetry or, or growing a garden or building a you know, multi-billion dollar business and employing people and producing resources. There's no right or wrong. The question is, what's going to light you up? Because I can't tell you how many people, including billionaires, you know, I interviewed 50 of them over a period of three years, three and a half years, and I would... I would not say they all aren't happy because that's totally not true. You can be rich and happy. You can be poor and you can be happy. Uh, you know, problems are not, I always tell people problems and happiness have no relationship. You can have tons of problems and be happy. You, <laughs> you know. can be rich and unhappy. Exactly right. You well. can be the one. That does happen. So it really we're talking about true wealth is between your ears. It's, it's your brain and your heart working together. And it's defining what is life on your terms look like. And then putting a plan in place that really makes that happen and then making sure you're truly enjoying along the way. Because to me, there's nothing worse than an angry rich man or woman. You want to slap them. They got every resource on the planet. But the challenge is we all have a two billion year old brain. And it's, it's, it's basically trying, not trained to make you happy. Your brain is trained to make you survive. So survival means I got to look for what's wrong all the time, be prepared for it so I can fight it or flight from it. And in reality, we don't have a saber-toothed tiger to fight off anymore. So now people get stressed, even when they have money, because they think about what are people thinking of me? Or, you know, or do I have enough money? When, you know, the average American who's in dire straits, and I don't want to see anybody in dire straits. You know what? I feed 100 million people a year for the last two years. I'm going to feed a billion people through my partnership at Feeding America over the next eight years. I care. But I also know that if you're in poverty in this country, you're in the 1%. A financial people. You're not the 99%. You're 1% of the world. So the resources are available, but what we don't do is appreciate it enough. We let little stuff stress us out and big stuff stress us out. So in the book, the last chapter of the book is how do you organize your life so you don't just wait till someday when you have a certain amount of money and then you're happy because a lot of people get that amount of money and then they go, is it still enough? Or or what don't I have? Or what, what's happening with my family? They still find a way to be stressed. So money's not the solution. It's a vehicle. And if we use it right, it can enhance the quality of life. But we've also got to control these two things, the head and heart, in order to have the quality of life that we really deserve. So uh, presumably that, that, uh, that situation of, being in, of having achieved true wealth is going to be different for everyone, right? Yeah. I mean, we all have our own idea of what an extraordinary quality of life is going to be, what, what that financial freedom is going to help us to do and to achieve. So... How do we figure that out? Is there a, a, a universal formula that, that, that people can apply to sort of help them get to that point where now that, now that we, we've helped them achieve some financial independence and financial security, how do they themselves figure out what true wealth means for them? I think most people, if you, if you sat down and said, what does life look like on my terms? What would my ideal vision for my life be like? And you took five or 10 minutes, I do with people all the time, most people with just a little bit of prodding or a little bit of state change, you know, where they're not in their head, most people can start to list out what they'd want for their life. But what I found is life on your terms, you know, extraordinary life, whatever it is, 
you need two master skills to really achieve that quality of life and sustain it. Like anybody can get rich. Staying rich is a different thing. And when I say rich, I don't just mean financial. I mean emotional, spiritual, physical, right? So the two skills are number one is the science of achievement. The science of achievement, I call it science of achievement because it is a science. Anyone who applies the principles of science can get the same result. So there's a science to wealth. When I wrote Money Master the Game and now Unshakable, I said, okay, instead of me doing this from my perspective, I've worked with Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 financial traders in the history of the world, a guy that in 1987, when the market dropped 22% in a day, made 200% for his clients that year. I mean, I know a lot. But what if I go to everybody? What if I dig under everybody and find out what it is? And what I found was all these people invested in different ways, but there were certain fundamental things in common. We call them the core four in this book here. And I began to share those and I started to apply them for myself. Same thing with health. Everyone is biochemically unique, right? But at the same time, there's certain fundamentals that you and I, while we're unique, if we violate those rules, it's a science. You're going to have disease or low energy dis-ease in your body, right? Mm -hmm. If you align with them, you're going to have abundance of energy. You're going to have passion. You're going to have intensity. You're going to have that physical vitality that can make you even more successful. So there's a science to achievement. And if you said, what does it take to achieve? Almost anybody watching this, my guess is, is an overachiever. It's the kind of person who wants to read a book like this, who goes to a seminar. They're always looking for the edge because that's what made them the best in the world at what they do or really great at what they've done. But there are three fundamentals I can tell you at the most basic level. Is if you're watching, if you're listening, think about this. Think about something, and maybe in your own life, Richard, think of what's something in your life today that once was a dream or a goal or seemed impossible. And I think all of us have that. So it could have been something as simple as, you know, growing up and maybe a car represented, especially for a lot of guys, a car was that first symbol of I've achieved something, you know, at a certain level, right? And you got that car and it seemed impossible. Or the job, or starting your own business, or a relationship. Mm -hmm. Can you think of one in your own life, something in your own life that was once seen impossible, but is now, you know, part of your life? Absolutely. Yeah. So what was it? Can I ask? Well, I think it was probably writing a book. Uh, yes. When I was a kid, I, I was a big reader, and I always dreamed of writing a book, and I never quite believed that I could do it. I've subsequently written three. That's awesome. Still can't quite believe that I did it, but but uh, it's uh, it's always an inspiring thing for me. And so I look back, and I think, wow, there was no guarantee that I was ever going to do that, that thing that I dreamed about in childhood. Yeah. It's amazing to me that it happened. Well, I, I love that. It's a perfect example because... What seemed difficult or impossible or seemed beyond, you now live. Some people don't even take those things for granted. They've dreamed of having a, you know, a date with this person or making love with this person. Now they're married. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> There's nothing there. The law of familiarity is the thing we also have to watch out for if we want to be fulfilled. Because the law of familiarity says if you're around anything enough, you tend to take it just a little bit for granted. You know, you got that brand new car. It was so exciting. You that new car smell. You drove by the plate class windows in the bank yeah. and saw yourself there. And then you get your first scratch and your brain goes, oh, my God, I can't believe this. And you're so upset, but you have to get over it. So you try to forget about it. And it's so painful. And then you get your second scratch. By the time you get your fourth scratch, it's a car. No, that's you, know? you know, it's changed. So familiarity gets in the way of it. But what I say to people is the way you achieve, and tell me if this was true for you, I always tell people if you look at the most basic key to achievement, it's that you become obsessed about something. You start to think about it constantly. You start to desire it. In other words, you focus on it. Focus is power. Wherever focus goes, energy flows. And so most people are focused on what they don't want instead of what they do want, so they experience more of that. So if you get obsessed about something, you can't stop thinking about it, your brain kicks into gear to try to figure out how to do that, even if you don't have a plan. I've talked to so many people and said, what's something you couldn't get out of your head? You wanted it so bad, it seemed impossible, and yet somehow it came together. The reason is there's a part of our brain. It's called the RAS, reticular activating system, big words. I'm called RAS for short. It's the part of your brain that notices things, that there's millions of things going on around you, millions. There's pulsation in your ear, you don't think about it to mention, the skin touching your clothing, the people walking by. But the RAS only makes you look at the things that really matter most. So an example would be if you, you, know, if you buy a car or you buy an outfit and suddenly you see that car outfit everywhere. Those cars and outfits were always all around you. But now your RES says, I own one of those. It's important, so you see it everywhere. Well, the same thing's true when you say, I want this. I desire this. Your brain can start to create a plan. That's step one. Step two is really fundamental. Sometimes you get by without it, but usually it takes massive action. 
If you dream about it, you put your focus in it, you want it, all of a sudden your brain goes crazy, you start reading a book, you talk to people, you ask resources, you go on the web, you do the research. And if you take massive action strongly enough and you keep changing your approach when it doesn't work, if you flex your approach, you'll find what's effective. So step two, step one is obsess, get totally focused, unleash your desire, that gives the energy. Step two is not waiting, it's massive action, keep changing your approach until you find effective execution. If you're running east looking for a sunset, I don't care how positive you are, you're not gonna see the sunset, it's the wrong strategy, not right? <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. So you gotta have a proven strategy and you can get there faster, same way I've done it with these books, is saying, I could go this or I could spend four years, interview 50 of the smartest people in the world, all billionaires that started with nothing and find out what they did and take compressed decades into days. That's really the purpose of everything that I do. So when you have that plan and you keep changing your approach, I always tell people, you know, how long would you give your average kid to learn how to walk? Before you turned to the kid and said, dude, it's never gonna happen, you're not a walker, just give it up. Right? People go, you're crazy, my kid's gonna keep trying until. Well, that's really step two. You keep changing your approach until you find it. And then the third step to achievement really is, as simple as it may sound, if you're obsessed, you know what you want, you're taking massive action, maybe you modeled somebody, figure out the right action so you get there quicker, and you're executing, you still need a little grace. Some people call it luck, you could call it God, but I really believe that there's the part we do and then there's the part that comes to us. But I do know grace shows up a lot more when you do the first two steps on your own and grace shows up a lot more when you acknowledge grace in your life, when you acknowledge that I was born in a world where I didn't have to build this internet that I can pull out of my pocket the answer to anything on earth. I am driving on streets I didn't pave. I'm reading books I didn't have to write. That's the gift of our lives. And I think when we experience that grace, we don't just experience more achievement, but we start to experience more fulfillment. And grace not only affects your ability to get there, but it affects what you do and how you live once you are there. It really determines the quality of your life because unless you live in a state of gratitude, you know, I, I did an interview um, uh, with Sir John Templeton, who as you know, is one of the first billionaire investors and just a brilliant man. He came from nothing. And he donated, I think it was 750, they still do it, the Templeton Fund, I think it's $750 million a year, it's bigger than the Nobel Fund that he donates. And one day I asked him, I said, what is the secret to wealth? And he looked at me, paused, this big smile and his eyes got really bright like they always did. And he said, Tony, it's what you teach. I said, well, I teach a lot of things, you know, which thing? And he said, gratitude. He said, because you and I, Tony, know billionaires that are miserable and it's because they're not grateful for what they have. And we both know people have no money, seemingly, but they're so grateful for their health, for their husband, for their wife, for their children. They're so grateful to God. They're so grateful for their life that they're rich. You know? So I think, I think it starts with that gratitude. It starts with that connection to grace, as simplistic as that sounds. And so it's not enough just to have your financial plan. You have all the money and be miserable. Let's have the money and be really rich emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. Well, and it's hard to imagine somebody becoming financially rich, becoming even, say, a billionaire, but if they lack that element of grace, it's hard to imagine them actually being happy. Well, you bring up uh, what I think is the second most important skill in life, right? To have extraordinary life, life on your terms, science of achievement. Second skill, the art of fulfillment. And it's art, not science. And the reason I call that art, not science is there are specific rules of the game to make money or lose money. There's rules of the game to get healthy, right? When it comes to fulfillment, we're all totally unique human beings. And a story I often share with people, because uh, it, it was so stunning to me personally, a great example of this is, like, you look in the environment, you look in the forest, you'll see what God or the universe loves, whatever your belief structure is. It's diversity. Everything's diverse. Nothing's the same, right? The same thing's true with people. You and even your wife or your son or your daughter or your best friend, even though you love each other, different things are going to fulfill you. And if you don't know what fulfills you and you're succeeding, I always tell people success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Mm -hmm. And I get the call so often from, you know, the CEO, from the, you know, the Grammy winner, or the Oscar winner, who achieved all they want, and then their brain went, is this all there is? Because they achieved, but they weren't fulfilled. Uh, but different things fulfill us. I, I give tell you a fun example. Steve Wynn's a dear friend of mine who built most of Las Vegas, right? Just absolute genius and a big part of Macau, you know, gambling business. He's just an amazing human being. And we're dear friends. And one day I get a phone call and he says, it's my birthday, where are you? <laughs> and I said, I'm in Sun Valley, Steve, and Sun Valley, Idaho. And we both have ski homes there. And he says, I'm in Sun Valley. He said, come on over, let's celebrate. I said, awesome, I'm on my way. He goes, listen, when you come, 
I want to show you this painting that I've got. He said, Tony, this painting I have coveted for more than a decade. I forget the number of years, but he said, I bought it from myself for my birthday. And he said, I've, he, I outbid everybody at Sotheby's. I paid $86 million to this painting. And I'm like, oh my God. The minute he said this, my brain's like picturing, what is this Renaissance painting? I'm, you know, the Mona Lisa, what is this, right? Some religious artifact. I don't know what it's gonna be, but it's gonna be gorgeous. So I said, I'm, I'm coming over. So I come over to the house and he says, take a look. And I look on the wall and it's an orange square. <laughs> now this orange square, I don't know if you've ever done this before. You go to a, like an art show or something and you go, it's a blue square and you go like, how much is that? They go $10 million, $86 million. And so I, te I look to him teasingly and facetiously and I say, you know what? Give me a hundred bucks and 20 minutes. I can duplicate this thing. I probably, <laughs> and it's called a Rothko. He goes, no, Tony, this is a Rothko. And he explains to me. And, and the reason I tease him about it is, to me, it's an orange square. To him, it's worth $86 million of fulfillment. It makes him happy. He's so sophisticated that every brush stroke has a meaning to him. For me, it's a square. Mm -hmm. So I'm not making fun of him. I'm making fun of me. We all have something different. What one person's orange splotch is somebody else's ultimate you know, desire. So you've got to find what fulfills you. Yeah, but in, in the book, you also tell the, the unfortunate story of, of Robin Williams. Well, it is just such a good point. Uh, I was trying to think what would be a, a cautionary tale that people could relate to. So over the last year, while well, I've been speaking everywhere in the world, I've been you know in Australia, Sydney, Australia, I've been in Beijing, I've been in Tokyo, I've been in LA, I've been all over the world, Peru. And all the places I go on, I ask people a simple question. I say, how many of you in this room loved Robin Williams? I don't say you liked him. I say, if you liked him, don't raise your hand. But if you really love this guy, you know you didn't know him, right? 98% right? of the room raises their hand. I mean, all over the world. He's right? a beloved guy. Totally beloved guy. Tens of thousands of people everywhere, right? So I say, okay, here's my question. Was he an overachiever? Was he a master of the science of achievement? And most people nod their head and say, well, let's look at it. Everyone goes to Hollywood thinking they're going to be a star. Almost nobody does. Mm -hmm. He decided he was going to be a TV star. He was going to have his own show. He did it. Then he decided, I'm going to have the number one show. He did it. And some people are old enough to remember the name Mark and Mindy. That was it, right? Then he said, you know what? I want to have the most magnificent family I love and loves me. And he did it. Then he said, I want to make more money than I could spend. And he did it. Then he said, I want to make movies. TV's easy. I want to make movies. Then he said, I want to win an Academy Award for Richard for not being funny, which is his number one skill. And he did it. He won a dramatic you know, Academy Award. And then he hung himself. I mean... How do you explain that? I mean, here's a man who is loved by tens of millions of people all over the earth. I mean, really loved them. He lit everybody up except himself. And he left so many people shocked. And worse than that, his children and his wife, you know, I, you can only imagine what they've been through. And he was a good man, a really good man. But he suffered for decades because he succeeded but clearly the suffering was there. The suffering was why he did cocaine. It's why he drank alcohol to extreme. It's why he did the things he did. And then in the end, you know, he had a disease, but his body was worn out. So I look at this and I say, look, I know you're not watching. You're not going to go commit suicide. But most of us live a life where we succeed, but we're not totally fulfilled. And to me, that's a travesty. And maybe the beauty of what we can learn from Robin Williams is you know, when you get on an airplane, one of the first things they do is they say to you, if there's a lack of oxygen and the mask comes down, put it on your kid first. No. They say, put it on yourself first. Sounds so selfish. But the reason is, if you don't take care of you, you can't help your kid. Well, the same thing's true. If you can't be fulfilled, then you're not really going to be helping anybody else long term. And so my mindset has been to help people end suffering. So, uh, Tony, you asked me a question about my life. Let me turn the tables and, and put something back on you. You say in this chapter that you see so many people, maybe not to the extreme of Robin Williams, but still, who are missing out on so much of the joy and the fulfillment that they deserve to experience. But nobody teaches us how to be happy. I mean, yeah. you, you try, but yeah. uh, what's your method? How do you do it? I, I think it's really simple, truthfully. Um, to be fulfilled, there aren't hard, fast rules, right? Because we're all fulfilled by different things. But there's a couple of principles that will guide you. The first one is you've got to grow. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many millions of people love you. I don't care how great your children are. We grow or we die. It's the nature of a human being. In fact, the purpose of a goal is not to get the goal. People get the goal, like I said, and go, is this all there is? The purpose of a goal is to become more. Mm -hmm. 
Because what we get, as much as we get, it's never gonna make us happy. Those are tools that we can use to help people, help ourselves, help our family. But what makes us happy is who we become. And so, you know, if you grow, I always tell people, if you wanna know what it takes to be happy, it's one word, progress. If you're overweight, but you just start making progress, you haven't lost it all yet, but you lose the five or 10, you start feeling more, you're gonna be on fire. If your finances are messed up and you pick up a book or you get a coach or you get somebody and you start working towards it, even though you're not there, you see progress, you're lit up. That's because we're wired to grow because everything in the universe grows or dies. That's not Tony Robbins' law, that's the law of the universe. But also, I really in my soul believe we grow so we have something to give. Because when you look at what makes us really happy, you know, you can only feel so good by yourself with alcohol or drugs or sex or whatever. Music, all those are beautiful, wonderful things. But most of us, when we have a great experience that lights us up, what's the first thing we want to do? Share with somebody we love. Why? Because when you share it, it magnifies. Mm -hmm. Relationships magnify human emotions. And so for me, the real focus is showing people how to really get so that they grow and they give, they contribute beyond themselves. I'm more on fire. I, I wrote this whole book and I wrote Money Master. I've spent the last, what, five, six years giving away $10 billion. I didn't make a penny from any of this, but I've done it. I've been more excited about feeding a billion people than any freaking house or car or plane or anything else that's there because there's just so much more meaning when it's not a job, just you, when your life is about something larger. But here's the challenge. I said earlier, we have this two million year old brain, right? And it's looking for what's wrong to help you survive, right? It's always looking what's wrong. It's not gonna make you happy. So for years, I've taught people how to go into a peak state, athletes, business people, presidents of countries, because when you're in a peak state, think of it as like a high energy state where you feel extraordinary, where you're really the master of your world. When you're in that state, producing results is easy and you have tremendous energy. If you're in a low energy state and you love somebody, let's say in an intimate relationship, two people can totally love each other, but if they're, in a, they're frustrated, they're overwhelmed, they're stressed out, they're worried, they're in a lower energy state, then what happens in that low energy state is you'll say things and do things that'll hurt this relationship without even meaning to. Good people will say the wrong things when they're pissed off and frustrated and you can't take it back. So I've always taught people live in a peak state, train yourself to be energy rich, not energy poor. Poor financially you can solve, poor energy you have nothing, right? And then I was in India a couple of years ago with a friend of mine, his name was Christian G, known him for years. And he said, Tony, you know, the whole thing you teach about peak state and energy rich versus energy poor, he goes, I believe it 100%, but he goes, I have a little twist on it language wise. And it really pierced me when he shared it with me. He said, what if peak states versus lousy states or energy rich versus energy poor states, what if we switch those two words for beautiful state, mm -hmm. peak state, anything that's beautiful, it could be happiness, it could be joy, it could be creativity, it could be fun, it could be being driven, it could be hungry, like emotionally hungry, it could be grateful. Those are one states. What if every emotion you ever felt was either a beautiful state or what you call low energy, we call a suffering state. Mm -hmm. Now you and I are overachievers. Most of our listeners are overachievers. We don't suffer just like, you know, you know overachievers don't have fear. They have stress. <laughs> I always tell people stress is the achiever word for fear. You go, I'm all stressed out. How come I gotta get this done? Well, what if you don't? But I gotta get it done. But what if you don't? It'll fall apart. What if it falls apart? Well, then it'll fail. What if it fails, then I'm a failure. If I follow the trail of your stress, it'll take me to your deepest fear, right? So what I try to do with people is, I try to show them that if you wanna change your life completely, you gotta acknowledge that you do suffer. And if you'd asked me two years ago, do I suffer? I would have laughed at you, not in an ego way. I just go, are you kidding me? I have this incredible mission. I get to work with millions of people. I have four magnificent children. I have a wife that I adore. I'm physically fed, I'm financially free. I do not suffer. But if you take this new definition, and you can be honest with yourself, I did experience stress, frustration, overwhelm, you know, pissed off. In fact, I realized at one point, Richard, that my happiness was really cheap. All I had to do was reaching for it in my pocket here, it's missing. All you had to do was have my phone because you know, you know, I have 31 companies. We do 5 billion in sales annually. We're in seven radically different industries all around the world, 1,200 employees. What's the chances that right now someone is screwing up in one of those companies, i.e. not doing what I think should be done? Reasonably high. Yeah, like 100%. Yeah. <laughs> and if I get a little text in there, sometime in that day, it's going to be there. I'll be like, ah! And all of a sudden, my happiness will be gone just because somebody didn't do what I thought they should do out of 1,200 people around the world. 
So, and we all do this. What are the chances that everyone you care about and everyone you interact with is going to do what you want, the way you think they should do it, the right way all the time? Zero. So if the only time we're happy is when people do what we think they should do, or we do ourselves what we're supposed to do, we're not going to be happy very much. I love the way you put it. Um, if I follow the trail of your stress, it will take me to your deepest fear. That's right, because so much of us think about we live with stress. We sometimes we're proud of stress. Yeah, you're right. We, we take it for granted. Uh, but if you think of it, stress as a symptom of something that's kind of deeper that you do need to address and, and not necessarily something to just accept or even in a strange way be proud of. Yeah. Right? Suffering. There's some knowledge in that. I think a lot of people, I'd be one of these in the past, that if I was suffering, i.e. if I was stressed out or frustrated or pissed off, I'd say I get stronger, I get better, my mind gets even, maybe it did, but I've learned that I can do that without the stress and it's usually 10 times better. When you're stressed out, you limit your ability to interact with people plus in a stressed out state, you're not going to connect with your wife or your husband. You're not going to be there for your kids because you're not present. You're in your head and the mind is running the show. And so what I show people in the book and in the chapter is I have people write down, what are your two or three most stressful thoughts? The most consistent stressful thoughts you have. Give me one of yours if you're willing to. I'm putting you on the spot. If you want, we can cut it out of this thing. <laughs> What's a stressful thought that you have? Because we all have them. Right? Well, I, I suppose, uh, let me think about that, because we all have them. Of course. I certainly have them. My most stressful thoughts? Or one of them. Uh, I'll lose my job. Okay. Uh, that's I'll another, be, that's I have problem. two wonderful kids that, that I'll fail them in some way. Or yeah. I think, actually, now that I think about it, the most stressful thought that I have is that something would happen to my children, that my yeah. children would get sick or hurt in yeah. some way, or something worse that I can't even talk about. Yeah, and the same thing for me, my children and my wife. I would pick the same thing, right? Yeah. And so, first of all, when I do this in a room of 10,000 people, I'll have everybody write down their two or three most stressful thoughts, and then we go around the room, and I have people just read their thoughts and tell us what it is. And I'll say, who else has that thought? And you'll see 9,000 hands out of 10,000, sometimes more, raising their hand for like 90% of these. And my point is, what you call your thoughts are not your thoughts. They've been around for millions of years. If I would have told you 100 years ago, we're going to go to the moon and back, you would have called me crazy. The term was lunatic. That's where it comes from. Or you're going to have this little box in the future, and you pull it out of your pocket, and you can push a couple buttons, and you can see somebody on the other side of the world and talk to them. Because invisible waves are going to be circling the earth, and those waves will come into the box, and you can then interact. Witchcraft, it's insane. Thoughts are invisible waves. They've been around forever. And when you get in certain states, you think one thought. When you get in other states, you think another thought. It's like turning the channel. Right. And so what I really show people in the book how to do is how to turn the channel so that you're not suffering and you're living in a beautiful state. But what does it take? Let's just quickly say it. Number one, it takes acknowledging what's your favorite flavor of suffering. Is it worry? Is it stress? Is it anger? Is it loneliness? Is it boredom? Is it overwhelm? And then noticing what are the thoughts that trigger that and realizing it doesn't matter how much money you have, those thoughts can still make a billionaire crazy and frustrated and overwhelmed. And so what I show people to do is a process of how to let go of those thoughts. And we walk through that in the book in detail. But fundamentally, it starts with making the most important decision of your life, which is, if I would ask me up until two years ago, I wouldn't say it's who you spend time with, who you love. Because who you spend time with is who you become. Mm -hmm. I, think it's a, I think it's still one of the most important decisions in life. But you can pick the right person and still do things in your head and make yourself miserable. So you really have to decide. The most important decision is, do I want to be happy? Will I commit to being happy? More important than happy. Sometimes you'll be so happy you smile so much your face hurts, right? You need variety. Am I committed to living in a beautiful state even when it doesn't go my way? even when it rains on my parade, even when my biggest fear shows up. Because I can't control whether your husband or wife will live or die or get sick or leave you or get a divorce. I don't want any of that to happen to any human being. I hate suffering. I do anything I can to help people not suffer. But I can't control that. You can. You can. There are people who have lost their arms, lost their sight. There have been people that have been through the most horrific experiences in life and they found a way to still be happy because they've made the decision that life is too short to suffer. I've interviewed dozens and hundreds over the years, but dozens that like have impacted my soul, that made me realize I can change this. I've just gotten used to it. I bought into the theory that this, this survival software that's constantly running and making you suffer, that that's normal. No, that's what the mind will do. And mind has been around forever. What I'm gonna do is something different. And the way I get out of suffering, I give myself a 90 second rule. 
It's really simple. I say, look, if I feel myself starting to feel that stress, feeling that pissed offness or upsetness or concern or worry about my kid, whatever, I realize that's not going to make it better. Life's too short to suffer. And then I just kind of breathe slowly, slow everything down. And I just watch the thought go by and go, look at that crazy thought. Because everybody's had crazy thoughts. Everybody's had the thought, I'm going to kill that son of a bitch, right? And then you don't kill him because you don't believe that thought. It's the thoughts that are stressful that you believe that mess you up. When you question them, you break the pattern. And then the last thing besides the 90 seconds, and by the way, Richard, be honest, in the beginning, it should have been like a four-hour rule, <laughs> maybe a four-day <laughs> rule. I was not very good. A waiting period. Yes. Yeah, so, but what's nice is the more I've done, it's like a muscle. The more I've trained myself to do it, I can authentically tell you now, it takes a lot for something to take more than 90 seconds for me now. And the level of joy surpasses all the money you could ever have in a million years. And then the money, it's easier to even make money because you're not attached. You don't have the fears. You don't have the you know, scarcity that people have because you feel so rich already right now. I always tell people, don't wait to be rich. What is that richness? It's abundance. It's joy. It's happiness. It's contribution. It's getting out of yourself. Because right. as long as we're thinking about, oh my God, I lost something or you did something. Now I have less love, less respect, less money. If I think loss less or because you did something, or because I did something, I'm never going to have what I want in my life. Loss, less, never. Those three thought patterns, mm -hmm. they're the source of all suffering. And the antidote, see it for what it really is, know it's BS, and find something to appreciate. What I tell people is, if you want to change your life overnight, I'll give you one example real fast. Uh, I'm privileged enough uh, to have my own private jet. And it's a global express, so I can go to China nonstop. It's an unbelievable gift. It's having your office in the sky. I'm so grateful to God for it and all my partners and team members that I can have this privilege. But for most of my life, I obviously flew commercial, and I would fly to Australia three times a year, which from the East Coast is 40 hours round trip. It's like some people's idea of a work week. It's kind of crazy. And you get on, let's say, in L.A. on the last leg, and it's 14 hours on Qantas Airlines. And... I remember getting on there and I get so stressed because I'm like, I'm out of touch with all 31 companies, all my employees. All, you know, I got to be here for 14 hours. And when I land, it's all going to build up the emails, the texts, the slacks, all that stuff. Right. And then I, one day I thought to myself, well, what's stressful about sitting? I mean, what a whiner you are right in your head. And shortly after that, I get on it because they don't have Internet on the international flights. And I get on the flight on Qantas and they announce, ladies and gentlemen, we have international Internet. And it was, people were cheering, people were clapping. It was like God descended into the plane, right? And I was embarrassed. I wanted to stand up and clap. I didn't, but I was feeling it inside. Like, yes, right? Thank God. 12 minutes later, you know, nine minutes later, whatever it really was, it goes down and it never comes up again. That's it. But here's no what's worry. crazy. What do you think happened to the people on the plane? 10 minutes ago, it was this miracle. Now people are pissed because it's an expectation. What kind of company does this? What's wrong with the internet? And so my point is, we have become, so much of our life has been to come about expectation. And if your expectation isn't met, you suffer. If you trade expectation for appreciation, your whole life changes in a moment. In the middle of my stress, there's always something to appreciate. I can appreciate my health, my children, the opportunity. I have this mission. There's so many things. But if you don't change your focus, you'll let the reaction of survival software, this two million year old brain, make you think your life is messed up and you'll lose the joy that actually is there. So in the book, I give you some techniques yeah. that you can do in two minutes that take you out of suffering and put you right back into real wealth. And, and when you have that kind of abundance, your relationships prosper, your health prospers because you don't have all that stress, your joy prospers, you're rich today while you're also making your financial world be where you want it to be. And Tony, it's one of the things that I really like about this book, Unshakable, is that you not only provide uh, really powerful tools for financial knowledge and financial growth, but you combine them with these tools to, that, that acknowledge that money is important, but it's not everything and it's, it's, not, not, it's not enough. Yeah, it's not everything. Uh, right? Uh, uh, and I think you do that within the covers of one book in about 200 pages. Pretty remarkable, actually, right? I think yeah, people can, can read this book, Unshakable, and really feel empowered to take some, some steps in their lives, their financial lives, but also their psychological lives, their emotional yeah. lives, the, uh, their whole beings. Yeah, it, uh, it's, I really want people, listen, we're all going to suffer because that's what the mind does, but you don't have to stay there. And what people really want is joy. What they want is happiness. What they want is love. What they want is connection. What they want is to feel like their life matters. And they want to have financial freedom. 
If you get the financial freedom without all those other things, you're poor. If you do both, you truly are rich and the riches will show up in the way you live your life and, and the way you give and the way you love and the way you're with people. And that is heaven on earth for someone who really practices it. Well, Tony, I've really enjoyed talking about this book, Unshakable, with you. Um, I think it's a, or it's a remarkable book. It's a real contribution. Um, whether, whatever your level of financial expertise is, I think there's a lot to get out of this book. Um, and it's been a real pleasure and an honor for me to have the chance to sit here with you and Peter Malouk and, and uh, do these podcasts and try to communicate uh, these messages that you're getting out that really can make a difference in people's lives. So thank you for that. Well, I, it's been my honor. I'm grateful you took the time and energy of the editor of Worth. So we're both very, very grateful that you help us get this message out. We're hoping it will reach as many people as possible. And as you know, um, we're going to feed another 100 million people this year from this, at least 50 million from this book, and then I'm going to match it. So That's it's going to touch everybody's lives. That's a, you know, a triple win is the way I like to play. Congratulations. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Take care. Hey, it's Tony Robbins. Listen, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Unshakable podcast. It's the companion to my new book, Unshakable, Your Financial Freedom Playbook, Creating a Peace of Mind in a World of Volatility. And it's co-authored with my dear partner, Peter Malouk. Listen, by listening to this series, along with reading the book, you'll be armed with all the essential facts and strategies you need to help transform your financial life. So if any of the ideas here you've heard today have struck a chord with you, and you're interested in getting a second opinion on your own financial plan, or create one if you don't have one, then please go to getasecondopinion.com. That's getasecondopinion.com to have a creative planning advisor take a look at your portfolio, or again, help you to create a plan it's completely complimentary, completely free, and there's no commitment necessary. I'd also personally love it if you'd leave a review of this podcast on iTunes. I'd love to know what you thought of the program. And also, I'd love to hear any new questions you have, any takeaways you took from the podcast. And if you want to share any success stories about your own journey towards financial freedom, we'd certainly love to hear about it. For more information about my book and some more related articles, videos, and other information that can help you to create that unshakable state and achieve the financial freedom you want, go to unshakable.com and know that 100% of this book's profits are being donated Feeding America. 45 million people in this country every night don't know where their next meal is going to come from. 17 million are children. And your contribution to this book, 100% of those profits are going to feed them. We'll feed 50 million people this book and we'll feed another 50 million, 100 million next year alone just with the additional bonuses that I'm offering, the additional benefits I'm getting Feeding America as well. So thanks for being my partner. And live strong, live with passion, and we'll hear you and meet you on the next podcast. The Unshakable podcast was produced in collaboration with wealth management firm Creative Planning. It is hosted by Richard Bradley, editor in chief of Worth Magazine, and features business and life strategist Tony Robbins. This podcast is produced and distributed by Robbins Research International, copyright 2017.